this is a frustrating market for both bulls and bears. We're still dealing with the echoes of the crisis, which are going to slow the economy, hit the banking sector, and make the recession even more likely as the year ticks forward. We haven't really seen U.S. growth deteriorate that much yet. I think there's still a lot of lingering concerns over credit tightening. We have to keep in mind that tightening access to credit and tightening financial conditions is exactly what the Fed has been trying to do. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's get you to the weekend, live from New York City. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK is going to take a long weekend. Equity futures on the S&P 500 totally unchanged. A little bit later this morning, we need to discuss this story. President Biden could be looking at formally announcing his re-election campaign as early as next week. Exclusive reporting from the team here at Bloomberg. We'll catch up with Anne-Marie a little bit later. We need to catch up on this market as well. Tons of Fed speak, lots of earnings. This line from Michael Hartnett of Bank of America this morning. To end the week, Lisa, sell the last rate hike. That's his mantra. He's been talking about it for a number of months now. The bears are consistent, even with a lot of hate, even with not being necessarily right for a while. The bears are consistent that they are still bearish and that, frankly, the data just confirms it. And if the market's not confirming it, well, they're going to catch up because it's only a matter of time. Easing of financial conditions premature. The view from Unicredit. We've heard so much like this from Unicredit, from Bank of America, from JP Morgan, Marco Kolanovic, from Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley. They have not changed their view over the last month. If you look at the earnings, it confirms what they're saying. That's the issue, is that the fundamental story actually is very much in line with the bearish prognostications. If you take a look at earnings coming in below expectations, yesterday we saw actually a tick up in the usage of the emergency loan programs from the Federal Reserve, catering to some of these banks. You know, on one hand, nothing massive. On the other hand, a signal that all is not clear. We are not completely out of the woods at a time when it's clear the economy is slowing, albeit alongside inflation. We've seen some signs of stability in the banking sector. I'm with you on the latest data, a little bit unnerving, but overall more signs of stability than not. Profitability problems, though, are going to persist, we imagine, for some of the smaller banks, Lisa. That's going to lead potentially to tighter financial conditions. For the Federal Reserve, I still don't think the Fed really have the answers they want or need beyond May. And that's the problem beyond May. They can't give you anything beyond next month. So yesterday we heard a slew of Fed speak. You did a fantastic nursery rhyme about it. I do think there was a very cohesive message for the first time, which is one and done. They're going to hike one more time and they're going to pause. And that seems like the consensus right now in the Federal Reserve. Now the issue for markets is how long are you going to pause for? Basically, are you going to keep it there for a longer period of time or are you going to keep cutting in the face of some pretty significantly deteriorating information? Yesterday, the leading economic indicator uh, that came out at Not 10 a.m. came in strongly in recessionary territory, really deeply negative. How much does this sort of edify a feeling that we are heading towards something, albeit a drip by drip by drip, not necessarily a catastrophic collapse? To be specific, to be really specific, when I'm talking about the unknown beyond May, I'm not talking about rate hikes. I'm talking about their understanding of tightening of financial conditions and lending standards from the financials, from the banks. Patrick Harker talked about that over at the Federal Reserve. I expect to see tighter credit conditions for households and businesses that may slow economic activity and hiring. We understand the direction, but then this, but the full extent is still unclear. That's about the magnitude. I still don't think we really know what the rest of this year is going to look like on that front. We don't know what the rest of the week is going to look like, even though it's Friday. I mean, honestly, like this is this is a, they're they're in the unknown territory, but so is everybody else. Equities right now softer by about a tenth of one percent to wrap up the trading week in the equity market. Let's run through things for you. That's stocks. Let's look at bonds as well, with the yields basically unchanged on a ten-year three fifty-two sixty-one in the FX market. Euro dollar back in away just a little bit down two tenths of one percent one nine fifty-one. I have to say, Lisa, over the last couple of days, pretty tight trading ranges for the single currency against the dollar. Yeah, and it has been sort of the stasis as people game out what's going on. Honestly, it's been a trading range pretty much everywhere, and it's been frustrating for a lot of people calm that seems to belie some of the angst underpinning it. We just got Regions Financial, the latest of the regional banks coming out. They actually beat expectations pretty much across the board, although provisions for credit losses came in slightly above expectations, 135 million versus 122.7 million. But if you take a look at the net interest margin, it actually came in slightly above. This is the question of profitability. And it goes to this issue of where are the strongest going to get more strength? Are they going to consolidate today? Well, we also get H8 
Fed data on commercial banks and deposits, and we'll get perhaps some more information. 9.45 a.m., we got a slew of data out of Europe earlier this morning. We get the latest from the U.S. S&P uh, Global U.S. Manufacturing and Services PMI. The consensus from the Eurozone PMIs that we got earlier was services doing better than expected, manufacturing doing worse than expected. How long can this bifurcation happen before one carries the other? And this, to me, is a real tension as we see uh, sort of uh, different moving pieces of this economy. And at 4.35 p.m., is this the last gasp? Is this it? This is it. Fed Governor Lisa Cook is speaking at Georgetown University. The last gasp before all goes quiet. What's left to say? I mean, honestly, this is what we've been saying. But the fact that there seems to be a consensus. Yeah. Yes, that there is enough information to raise 25 basis points. But after that, probably not so much. Hike and hold. Maybe the hike in May is the last hike of this hiking cycle. Joining us now is Luke Cower, asset allocation strategist over at UBS Asset Management. Luke, good morning to you. Great to catch up with you, buddy, oh, as always. I want to pick up on that line from Bank of America and Michael Hartnett. You know his work well. Sell the last rate hike. How do you and the team over at UBS feel about that, Luke? Sell the last rate hike. Well, we think equities at the, at the headline level, you know, quite some time haven't been that that exciting. Uh, as in, you know, that's not necessarily where you're going to see the the big move, the the break to the upside. Have a lot more confidence in the and the under the hood trades. What's been really really stark for us is, you know, over the past month, what's really crazy is how much the volatility environment has normalized cross asset. Whether that's you know VIX move. Uh, spread uh, spread or in FX. All of that is below where it was before we had an episode of, of banking stress. But the relative value positions that really got hit very hard during that, uh, you know, kind of short period of time where we were, you know, pricing in some tail risk with U.S. regionals, those haven't retraced much at all. So that to us is where the opportunity is tactically much more so than focusing on whether, you know, uh, to, to sell the last rate hike because it's it's not even a foregone conclusion that the that the Fed and the cycle is done, as, as you guys have noted. So, Luke, with that in mind, would you expect that relative underperformance to close or for the VIX to mount higher? Which one's going to close? So... We, uh, in our view, the kind of the trade here is that the oxygen is coming back into the room from a macro perspective. Whenever you're talking about U.S. financial system risk, that's the only narrative that's going to matter. We get that. We understand. But we're putting more and more time, distance and data between that episode. So we do, do expect this to close much more so from the, uh, you know, some of the cyclical segments like large cap financials outperforming tech, uh, closing more than, say, you know, the the VIX spiking up to you know, levels consistent with a, a real growth scare. That would be our call. So you mentioned tech. Next week, we get tech earnings. How concerned are you about these as a bellwether at a time when there have been some signs that chip manufacturers are still facing some real headwinds? Well, so with uh, with tech for us, it's the the combination of the fact that even the earnings growth that you know they are in some in some place of the market they won't post it and some they will but even uh, for the the group in aggregate the earnings uh, growth they're going to post uh, isn't that much stronger than the the rest of the index to justify being priced at such a higher multiple to the to the index still so that's it's still more of a, a value play that in they're a lot more susceptible to mistakes if we talk about you know uh, high valuations at the index level. We all know what's driving that. So it's just a, it's a situation where, as you say, bad news can have more of an impact based on the initial conditions of, of valuation. Luke, I'm curious also your view on China and the potential influence on tech earnings, especially because you've come on this program before and said that you were bullish uh, on Chinese equities and Chinese bonds, this idea of the assets that have been perhaps left for dead too quickly. Do you still feel the same, both about Chinese assets and the Chinese aspects of some of these tech firms, in light of the recent discussion, the recent rhetoric and the recent proposals from the Biden administration? Yeah, I... Uh... I do think that you do have to take those kind of note of of those and those risks, and you know that's that's one reason why in some cases you have to be a little more choosy about whether you're playing Chinese equities from you know, primarily onshore or offshore perspective that allows you to mitigate some of those risks. But uh, to talk about that macro oxygen coming back, yes, this is the the China the positive China story uh, that has we've gotten more and more evidence, even in even some green shoots things resembling green shoots in, in real estate uh, over the past month. We think the market can now focus on that in an environment where the the market isn't worried about pricing details. Uh, do geopolitics kind of play a 
a big potential role in how investors are going to treat China and uh, perhaps keep it in a valuation penalty box. Uh, very much perhaps that's you know something that's part of the distribution. However, would also say there's a lot of, of moving parts in the U.S.-China relationship right now, and to you know to boil it down to a positive or negative headline we might see on a on a week to week basis uh a lot of those kind of uh, prophesied catalysts haven't necessarily come to fruition and you know I still do think there's a lot of fluidity there Luke, last time we caught up euro dollar was around 106 i believe it was march 2nd 10597 and we asked a friend of yours on the team at UBS for a call on euro dollar your dog said that we should go long. <laughs> Went from 106 to 11076 on Friday. Luke, Twain made quite a call on a single currency. Where are you and the team <laughs> at Kazakawa now on foreign exchange? He's, I, uh, he's, he's going to put me out of a job, and then who's going to buy him bully sticks, right? <laughs> oh, man. But uh, no, on the, on the broad dollar view, I think the, you know, kind of our take here is that the, and kind of similar to what you've been saying, the, the Fed sometimes when it talks about tightening has talked about tiptoeing through a dark room. Now that the Fed is tiptoeing through a dark room where they know there's broken glass on the floor, they're going to be a little more cautious even if they, they go beyond May. That for us, from a distributional sense, it cuts off the right-hand tail uh, side of the U.S. dollar smile. So the only way to get USD meaningfully, meaningfully higher is starting to price in recession. And we, of course, don't think that's uh, an, imminent, an imminent factor. So from a distributional sense, we, we still do very much like the, the short USD thesis here. Luke, you're one of the best. We appreciate you, mate. As always, it's good to catch up. Thank Luke Coward there of UBS Asset Management. I promise we wouldn't talk about Man United after last night's results, so we will not talk about Manchester United. I will talk about this, though. Shout out to Philip Aldrich in London for the team here at Bloomberg for putting this article together and drawing my attention to it. Bank of England policymaker, have you seen this story? Yep. Silvana Tenreiro, who Tom caught up with on Friday at the International Monetary Fund World Bank Spring Meetings, said this about her hawkish colleagues, compared them to, quote, a fool in the shower, Lisa, who scolds himself by being too impatient to wait for the water to warm up, saying interest rates are already too high for the economy to bear. A nod to Milton Friedman there in that quote. What do you make of that? A fool in the shower. <laughs> This is the fear that a lot of people have, is that at this point, people, uh, Fed officials or ECB officials or Bank of England officials are creating to the previous crisis and the previous mistakes and not gauging what the risks are in real time. It's a clear shift in six months from worrying about doing too little to worrying about doing far too much. Priya Misra in the next hour, we'll catch up with her on that and a little bit more in this bond market too. Priya Misra of TD. In the bond market right now, yields unchanged. Let's call it 353 on a 10 year. The equity market going nowhere on the S&P 500. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's deputy, Dominic, Dominic Raab, has quit after investigation into bullying complaints. The probe criticized Raab's behavior toward civil servants. It's a major blow to Sunak. He's tried to present his government as a contrast to the Boris Johnson era, which was marked by political scandals. Federal Reserve officials are backing another interest rate increase. At the same time, they're monitoring the economic fallout from stresses on the banking system. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester says she favors getting rates above 5% because inflation is still too high. Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic says he backs a one-and-done rate hike approach. President Biden will crack down on U.S. investment in key parts of China's economy. Bloomberg's learned he'll sign an executive order in the coming weeks that will limit investing in Chinese semiconductors, artificial intelligence and quantum computing. The president's hoping to get the backing of its G7 partners. And Elon Musk is doing an about face. After saying he would continue to drop the price of his EVs, Tesla is now increasing the cost of its Model S and X vehicles in the U.S. Prices for high-end models will be bumped up by $2,500, raising the cost of the sedan and SUV by 2% to 3%. Steep markdowns already this year took a toll on profitability and Tesla shares. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
I think at the end of the day, it, it, the crisis is too strong a word, and words like that get used a lot. The good news is the basic industry has reported good earnings um, across the board. Um, deposits have come down, but that's intended by the Fed taking money out of the system. It's got to come out of somewhere. Banking system is what they want to do to, you know, frankly, make credit tighter and help slow down the economy. So that's gone on. That's Brian Moynihan there, the Bank of America CEO, speaking yesterday during Bloomberg's Southside Leaders Forum in your equity market this morning. Welcome to the program and good morning. Your market looks like this, basically unchanged on the S&P 500 as we go towards the weekend. Yields unchanged as well on a 10-year maturity, 352.80, anything but unchanged when you look at Tesla over the last 24 hours. This stock got absolutely hammered post-earnings yesterday, down by close to 10% off the back of margins coming in a lot more than anticipated anticipated following price cuts yesterday more price cuts this morning <laughs> price increases on the high-end model s and model x in the united states are you keeping up with this one bremo don't you feel like there's just you know a dartboard and he's just like oh let's try this one i don't know maybe let's try this one and see what happens well and he it's... was busy with spacex yesterday but clearly to return back to tesla and get the focus there ford's jim farley says tesla and this pricing activity of the last couple of months could start an EV price war. I don't think that's going to be news to many people. I feel like that's where this is heading. Well, he said that the moves to bolster growth are, quote, completely rational and should surprise no one. To your point, this is exactly what's been expected. And you could argue that it was actually started by Chinese manufacturers of electric vehicles, which are dominating the industry and really could be said to be Tesla's main competition right now. Highly desirable for the consumer. Some of these vehicles, particularly EV, are so, so expensive. The government's trying to make them more affordable with credits and all of these rebates and all that good stuff. You see that effort around the world at the moment. But certainly this is what consumers want to see. And we caught up with, who was it yesterday? Julian Emanuel? Julian Emanuel, yep. We said, is this idiosyncratic? Macro story. Pushback said it was a macro story. And that's the reason why I think that this, the uh, earnings that we get next week with respect to the big technology companies will be really important if they signal a similar kind of pushback from the consumer in terms of pricing. Tons of bank earnings over the last couple of days. As Lisa pointed out, we go from banks to tech next week. Let's talk about the banks right now. We can do that with Myra Rodriguez Valadares, the managing director, principal at MRV Associates. Myra, wonderful to catch up with you. I really want your thoughts on the regionals, the small banks first, and maybe we can shift back to some of the bigger lenders in just a moment. Lisa jumped all over it yesterday, the net interest margins, the profitability story. Do you think it's too early to see some of the pain, to see how this is going to evolve over the next coming quarters? Yes, definitely. We have to remember that the banking turmoil started really the second and the third week of March. And by that point, the vast majority of regional bank strategies, all their transactions were well underway. And they certainly have benefited from high interest rates. They have definitely been charging more on a variety of loans and credit facilities, but they haven't been paying more as much uh, over on the deposit side. And so that net interest margin really benefited them. Uh, however, I do see a few trouble spots in the horizon. Like what? Well, you definitely see just about every single regional bank increasing their provisions for credit losses. And some of them had even released them uh, a couple of quarters ago. And so that's certainly a big sign that all of these banks are preparing at worst for the beginning of a recession or at best uh, for a softening of the economy. You also, of course, had a lot of banks uh, had a decrease in deposits. And for regional banks, this is incredibly important. Uh, anywhere from 75 to 85 percent of their funding comes from deposits. They're not diversified like the globally systemically important banks. So it's very important to watch not just the level of their deposits, but the diversity of the deposits. And that can be really hard for some of the really small regional banks because by definition they're concentrated in the communities and regions that they serve. Myra, there's a lot there to unpack. I want to stick on the loan loss provisions. There are two ways to read this. One is that they're continuing to lend more aggressively and just provisioning for more potential losses, or they are withdrawing some of their lending prowess on the heels of some of the deposit outflows, as well as the concern about loan losses that keep ticking up. Which is it? You know, unfortunately, the, the, the answer may not be so satisfactory to investors. It's a bit of both. Uh, there are a lot of signals 
in the economy, in the market, uh, that we really do need to pay attention to. We've got a lot of tech companies, consulting companies, retail media that all little by little have been announcing layoffs. So how are these people eventually going to pay their mortgages and their other credit facilities? You have American companies at their most indebted level in history. Many of those loans are leveraged, which means six, seven times debt over EBITDA. Uh, the Beige Book uh, just this week already stated that some of the banks uh, had already been tightening their credit conditions. So a lot of these banks are actually exhibiting good risk management when they increase their provisions. And I'm not seeing big rises in lending. Uh, you have trouble areas over in the auto loan sector. Yeah. Uh, you're already seeing high housing prices in the West. So there's a lot there to remind banks they need to remember the religion of good risk management. Myra, yesterday at 4.30 p.m., we got some data from the Fed on the latest emergency borrowings from that discount window, as well as a new program. I almost laughed at the way that it was interpreted. The optimist said this shows stability. The pessimist said this shows that people are still drawing down on some of these emergency facilities. How would you read the fact that we saw the first increase in usage of some of these operations in five weeks? Yeah, that's a great point. You really, the banks should no longer be borrowing if they're as stable and as liquid as they say they are. And this is one of the reasons why legislators and regulators really should be demanding that banks be more transparent. By the time that you and I get some of their liquidity metrics, such as the liquidity coverage ratio or deposits as a, as a percent of total funding, it's already too late. That information is old. But any of these facilities from the Fed is not the way that banks in a capitalist system should be running. They should be depending on their own cash flow. And that's why they, most of them need to be much better managed than they currently are. Mara, just to finish on this word, crisis, would you call it a crisis? This time last week, Mohammed al Aaron was with us and he said this is not a crisis. Brian Moynihan, Bank of America, not a crisis. What's in a word? Why is that word so important? It is incredibly important because, unfortunately, it starts to really be overused. This is bank turmoil caused by serious lack of good risk management, uh, and there's really no excuse for that. Silicon Valley Bank, Signature, all of those banks needed to have been back on the basics a long time ago of managing their interest rate risk, managing their liquidity. We have to be very careful not to overuse words. This is banking turmoil, uh, and it is not a crisis. A crisis is when we're really talking about massive interconnections with banks and the real economy, as well, of course, as, as corporations. 2007, 2009 was a crisis. This is not a crisis, and I'm really hoping that it doesn't go that way. Myra, appreciate your perspective, as always. Myra Rodriguez Valladares there of MRV Associates. This from Mohammed just yesterday when I caught up with him. We talked about that briefly. He also said this. It's not a credit crunch. He said this is a credit contraction. There's a difference. A credit crunch is economy-wide. It has massive implications. A credit contraction has distribution effects, and we should focus on those. This is the reason why people are having such a difficult time understanding the trajectory of the economy and just how significant the credit contraction will be, because we're used to 2008 in terms of the reference point. This is not 2008. This is something different. There is a slow-moving burn. And yet, bank turmoil, bank crisis, bank tremor, bank kerfunkle, at what point do we just call the whole thing off and then wait a second? Maybe not. Yeah, I just don't like it when it becomes dismissive and goes the other way. So what... On the one hand, you can say it's not a crisis, but on the other hand, you've got to make sure that you also don't say it's something you should ignore. Well, exactly. You can't say just because it's not 2008, we don't care. Right? Exactly. That can't be the There's nothing only... to see here. Right, exactly. Just because we're not seeing all banks, you know, in a flaming pile of just, you know, d distress doesn't yeah. mean that, you know... Benchmarking to the extreme is problematic. Well said. From New York City this morning, good morning to you all from a beautiful New York. This is Bloomberg.
two days without any gains on the S&P 500. Will it become three on the S&P? Right now, equity futures are negative by about a tenth of one percent. On the Nasdaq, with softer, lighter, lower, negative down by two tenths of one percent. Into the bond market, twos, tens, thirties. The two-year looks like this at 4.11. It spent the whole week above four percent. Backing away yesterday, though, off the back of weaker than expected economic data, claims coming in a bit higher than anticipated. That trend, is it a trend? I think some people starting to call it that. Yields are lower by three basis points on a two-year to 4.11. Your 10-year, 352.61. I want to finish on euro dollar. Very tight trading range over the last couple of days. 109.64 on the euro. The Fed, largely uncommitted to more rate hikes beyond May. It's about a pause now. As Lisa pointed out, the last day of Fed speak before the quiet period ahead of the May 3rd decision. Lisa Cook on tap following a slew of officials making the case for just one more hike. Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker saying this. Rates are close to where we need to be. We need to be a little cautious here to not just respond to the current level of inflation, but where we think it's going. You know, Lisa, this is interesting because Mohamed al talked about this yesterday as well with me. He said this Fed, and I think he said this on Friday, last Friday too, is too sensitive too data dependent and needs to take a longer term view on where they think this, this is heading and ultimately talk about some of the secular issues at play here as well. Do you think they agree on the longer term view? No. And based on the range of estimates next year, absolutely not. Which is part of the issue because uh, fundamentally we don't know what the destination is and this is coming at a time when, okay, now pause talk will talk about what is the threshold to cut because right now we're still pricing in cuts in the market this year. How much does the Fed push back against that or do they basically let the market decide for them, which is kind of how they've been operating for a little bit of time now. I was just jumping into the summary of economic projections on the terminal from the Federal Reserve. The range, never mind the median, let's talk about the range for Fed funds next year. 3.4% to 56 they're the numbers behind that answer. No, they've got no idea. But, you know, even when we talk to uh, economists, they don't have an idea either. They say it could go either way. A lot of people say, look, this is a very difficult time with a lot of distortions. And underpinning it, I think, really will be the data that we get at 9.45 a.m. and what we got out of the euro region, which is a complete bifurcation between manufacturing and services. How do you put those two things together when it's psychological? People want to get out and they want to explore. You're laughing because I'm going to go off therapy on us on a Friday. But I'm, you know, it's like people are willing to spend what they have on an experience, but they've already mm. bought the stuff that they need. It's flying an experience. <laughs> it is an experience. Yeah. I mean, you can put whatever uh, adjective that you want on it. But yeah, it's the whole trip mentality. What did Ryan S. CEO boomier. tell us earlier this week? Boomier Boom and boomier. Boomier and boomier. Yeah. That's kind of nuts, isn't it? Double digit fare increases. And he thinks we're going again. Double digit fare increases this summer. And that's for a budget airline. That is for yeah. somebody catering to people who are the most price sensitive. We all talk about it when we look at flight prices and how much they've gone up. Alan Ruskin flies Ryan Air. He joins us now. <laughs> Chief international strategist over at Deutsche Bank. Alan, great to catch up with you, sir. Thanks for being on the program with us. We're discussing this last hike. And a lot of people I know do a lot of work about the last interest rate hike and what happens after that. It's always easy, though, with hindsight to identify the last hike. Alan, do you think it's easier this time around to identify what the last hike of this cycle is going to be? Uh, John, unfortunately, I don't think it's easier. Uh, I agree entirely with the discussion you had earlier that uh, uh, the Fed and the market are faced with all sorts of uncertainties. We don't really have a huge amount of experience in terms of credit crunches. Uh, we have to sort of go back to uh, really 2008 was a, a particularly unique experience, or otherwise probably more familiar as really 19, uh, early 1990s. So. Uh, there's a sense that credit conditions are tightening sharply from a quantitative standpoint. But when you actually look at financial conditions from a price standpoint, they're actually easing. And it's this dichotomy, I think, that the Fed's wrestling with and not enough history to fully understand the quantitative effects. So I can easily see why you might see a pause and then a reignition of a rate hike in this cycle. There's more possibility of that than in past cycles. So I think in that sense, the identification uh, issue is more problematic than usual. What are you looking at, Alan, when you talk about that, given that so many people say inflation uh, readings are actually coming down much more quickly than expected? What do you push back against that with this idea that actually perhaps the Fed is underestimating those impulses? Yeah, I think uh, you're looking at uh, a little bit, of, again, of this uh, differentiation between what's going on the good side, where I think you're seeing excess supply kicking in, uh, whereby, you know, supply was looking at uh, 
being unable to meet demand and all of a sudden uh, is uh, in excess supply and supply deliveries are uh, improving quite dramatically. So you've got the good disinflation story that I think is for real. I think the services side is much more problematic. And again, there does seem to be underlying demand. So I think when you've got indices like you saw in Europe today, like I think you probably still see in the U.S. as well, whereby the service sector is uh, seriously outperforming the manufacturing sector, then the, in all likelihood, services inflation and wage-related inflation, uh, again, related to the service sector, is going to remain uh, obdurate and you know, pretty stubborn. So I don't think the Fed's going to be in a position to cut rates very, very easily. And I think the talk from the central bank, which is accurate, is that there's going to be more of a plateau period, that they cannot cut rates quickly or can't shift from rate hikes to rate cuts very easily. A lot of people are reading this as uh, negative for the dollar, and that's probably why we've seen such strength in the euro, perhaps surprising some people with the resilience of it. How does that play out for the remainder of the year if the Fed does finish with one more hike in May and signals that that's it? Yeah, I think, you know, when you look at uh, um, the way markets have traded once you get confidence that uh, the Fed rate hiking cycle is done, then there's some real standout trades. The most obvious is obviously bullish bonds, front-end steepness. Uh, you know, you get the dollar generally weakening. And I don't think uh, we're going to be an exception this year, particularly in the context of the ECB hiking rates when the Fed might well be cutting rates, uh, you know, towards uh, maybe the end of this year. So I think that is the, you know, the, the, I think the central view that's out there. But, you know, just because it's only you know, partially priced, I think the euro's still got plenty of run. And it's also happening against the background where the European current account position is improving and related to the interest rate changes, the capital flows are improving as well. Alan, when you say more room to run, what do you mean by that? From 110 to what? Yeah, look, I think we've been quite conservative in terms of forecasting 115 at year end. It doesn't mean that you can't go above there, but that's, you know, that's, that, that's the uh, uh, DB forecast. Um, you know, there's obviously an active debate in terms of, you know, how, how high this can go. Um, you know, typical ranges for the euro uh, are at least 10 percent uh, in a year like this, where there's a reasonable amount of volatility. Um, but I think the, the broader point, John, is not so much where we're going to end this year. I think this is a trend that can continue well into 2024 when you start to get into a, a much more serious Fed rate cutting cycle. And then, you know, you're talking about 120. Well, you touched on the projection that underpins the projection. It's the projection around rates of the Federal Reserve and also the ECB. Alan, I think we've got a decent idea, perhaps, of terminal rates of the Fed relative to where we think the terminal rate might be over at the ECB. Is that the way you see things? Not really. Um, I think uh, we can see a terminal rate, uh, you know, that the market's pricing, and I think it's roughly around 3.75, 3.8. Um, that's not unreasonable, really. Somewhere close to 4%, I think, is reasonable. I think the market underestimates the extent to which the labour market in Europe is tighter than almost anywhere in the rest of the world when one looks at unemployment rates relative to long-term averages. So I think there's considerable pressure from the labour market onwards to uh, underlying inflation pressures that will keep the ECB uh, you know, on a, in a pretty much a tightening phase through uh, 2023. Well, wow. Alan, thanks for that. Alan Ruskin there of Deutsche Bank. A roundabout way of saying that the ECB might go a lot higher than you think they're going to go. Another way of saying that if Americans want to visit Europe, probably they should do it now rather than, uh, you know, in a year from now when the dollar is going to be substantially weaker. That's basically what I heard. Maybe I am hearing something quite different. Convert your quite currency. Different. <laughs> yeah, we don't get the Paris party of last summer. Yeah, basically that if this, this whole sort of cheap option to go to Europe is looking less cheap, I mean, putting out the frictions of airplane costs and, and, um, and, and hotel bills. I feel like I'm sitting in Tom Keene's seat and I'm just channeling <laughs> his spirit right now in terms of the lens that I'm viewing this in. But absolutely, this feeling that Europe has a longer runway and the U.S. is a bit more fraught. It's highly dependent on the rest of the world. If you get the Federal Reserve cutting interest rates and the rest of the world is still doing OK, I think the idea that you get a weaker dollar off the back of that makes sense. 
if the rest of the world is not doing OK, the Federal Reserve is cutting interest rates and you have problems in Europe and China starts to fade a little bit, then you wonder whether you go to the other side of the dollar smile, so to speak, and the dollar starts to perform again. That's a different argument. I just don't think that's the consensus view right now based on the numbers we've seen from Europe this morning and the numbers we had from China earlier this week. Well, we've had UBS's Luke Kawa and we just had Alan Ruskin of Deutsche Bank and both had the same message, which is that euro is an attractive place to go right now versus the dollar. And you raise a great question. What does this mean? on a broader scale. The other thing that he said that I thought was so interesting, this divergence that we keep talking about with manufacturing and services, he thinks it could resolve to mean that inflation stays higher for longer. A lot of people are looking at the manufacturing sector as a leading indicator for everything else, where everything else is going to go and eventually it will cause this downturn. He's saying it's the opposite, that you see this sort of push-pull start that could lead us with a stickier type of inflation that I do not hear people talking about. It's always relative, but I think, relatively speaking, people are way more nervous about the U.S. economy than they are Europe at the moment. So Badra Japper over at SockGen put out some research yesterday evening and said this, the rise in initial jobless claims, the downside surprise on Philly Fed, they were catalysts for the rally in bonds yesterday. We all witnessed that. Yields lower, bonds up. Investors are on edge in our view, seemingly waiting for the next shoe to drop. They're neutral on rates, but they say this. Risk remains skewed to the downside on interest rates. So I keep going back to the range. Pre-SVB highs, post-SVB lows on the two-year. Pre-SVB highs, north to 5%. Post-SVB lows in and around 350. And the two-year somewhere in between right now. The bias, if you ask a lot of people in fixed income at the moment, seems to be still towards lower yields again, that we can't challenge those highs pre-SVB. The bias is that what we're seeing with respect to credit tightening, which we cannot gauge out, is really significant. That is the implication, that it will end up bringing down inflation quite substantially. I'm curious if Alan Ruskin would agree with that, because his view is that perhaps inflation is stickier. For a bit longer and it seems like that narrative has been cast aside for the moment inflation at tesla up next price cuts <laughs> yesterday price hikes this morning tesla got hammered in yesterday's session year to date still doing better than good dan ives of wedbush on tesla coming up next Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, complaints by government workers have brought down Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's close ally. Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab resigned after an independent investigation criticized his treatment of civil servants. The probe into accusations of bullying lasted months and it threatened to undermine Sunak's pledge to restore professionalism to the government. The U.S. wants to cut its dependence on Taiwan's microchips because of concerns that China might invade the island. Now Taiwanese officials are quietly urging their American counterparts to tone down the rhetoric. They're worried that U.S. comments are harming their business interests. President Biden may formally launch his re-election campaign as early as next week. The president's aides have planned for the possibility of making a video announcement to coincide with the anniversary of his previous campaign launch. He has been signaling that he intends to seek a second term next year, making it somewhat of an open secret. In Canada, police are investigating an airport heist that may have resulted in thieves getting away with millions of dollars worth of gold and other valuables. It took place at Toronto's International Airport, the country's busiest. Now, police say a container with more than $14 million in gold and other items was taken from an airport holding area. And Glencore says that it's on course for yet another bumper year of trading commodities. Energy products continue to be strong first quarter performance while its trading business is booming. Glencore is also trying to expand its mining operations. It's in the middle of a fight to buy Canadian mining rival Tech Resources. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I anticipate that monetary policy will need to move somewhat further into restricted territory this year. With Fed funds rate moving above 5% and the real Fed funds rate staying in positive territory for some time. The Fed has been focused on lowering inflation, which is absolutely essential if we want to support a growing economy and rising incomes. Lisa mentioned this a few times already in the last hour. 
The Fed speak yesterday sounding very, very similar. Cleveland Fed President Lorena Mester, Federal Governor, Federal Reserve Governor Michelle Bowman there weighing in on all of this and sounding pretty much the same, Bramo, that we're going to go one and then we might be done. And that's clear as mud in terms of the trajectory thereafter. And that's the issue, right? So let's say they finish uh, where they end at May, 20, uh, May 3rd when they hike rates by 25 basis points. That's the expectation. How quickly do they cut? What is the threshold for them to actually make a move lower? Mohammed's range of outcomes. Do you remember them? The three scenarios. Mm -hmm. You pause or you pause or you pause and then you have to cut or you pause and then you have to hike. Adam Ruskin, I think, put a little bit of doubt around that story that maybe it's just pause and pause and the May hike's the last hike. He's alone. I do not hear a lot of people talking about that. And to me, it's a compelling point, especially because of what we're seeing in terms of the stop-start economy. Is there enough fear on the Fed that that's a possibility, or have they discounted that fear with some of the incoming softer-than-expected inflation data? I mentioned a little bit earlier, about 10 minutes ago, that people that come on this program seem to be far more nervous about the U.S. economy right now than they are the European economy. Ken Vexler, an old friend of mine in London, fantastic voice on foreign exchange for a number of years, said this, if you think of it in terms of potential central bank policy mistakes, then surely the risk is skewed to Europe rather than the United States. States. That's an interesting way of looking at it, isn't it? Well, yes. And I think that a lot of people are trying to game this out. This has been narrative roulette. What do people call it? Narrative table tennis, yeah, table I think, tennis. was the, the phrase that it's exhausting. James Athey of Aberdeen used. You know, it's been, that's why I think that the trading range has been sort of interesting and nudgy in its lack of direction because people aren't sure what to make of the next narrative at play. Well, let's talk about Tesla and the next narrative around this name. So, yesterday, price cuts again. This morning, Price hikes, specific ones. They've increased prices of their Model S and X and those vehicles in the United States after the steep markdowns that we've seen through the whole year so far. Yesterday, the stock got absolutely hammered. This morning, the stock looks like this, positive by about a half of 1%. Dan Ives, Senior Equity Research Analyst at Wedbush, joins us now to talk about it. Dan, can you help frame the strategy here? Yesterday cuts, this morning hikes. What's happening? Look, they're trying to find the yin-yang, the balance, because I think for right now, it's about a driving demand, but also aggressive because of competition that we're seeing globally. And I think we're going to continue to see this, some cuts, some hikes. I think over the few next few months, you'll start to see it level off. But I think it just speaks to some agita that investors have because of margins. And that's why the stock got crushed yesterday. The sort of flip-flopping, though, of messaging in terms of cutting or raising prices, what do you make of Elon Musk's somewhat, uh, I don't know, uh, random approach in terms of how he's signaling, at least, the pricing? Yeah, Lisa, I think a lot of it is inventory-driven as well as what they're seeing in demand. I think, you know, from month to month, they could tell if ultimately they cut too much or maybe they need to cut more. And I think they're trying to find that balance. Now, when you look at SNX, that's a little different than what's happened with Model Y and 3. I think you're starting to see more of a, a sort of leveling off from a supply demand. Model 3 and Model Y, I mean, that's really the focus of the street in terms of how many more price cuts, what margins look like. Because right now, they're kind of going Game of Thrones style in terms of what they're trying to do from a pricing perspective. That's great for demand from a unit perspective, but obviously margins, that continues to be the elephant in the room. We were speaking with Julian Emanuel yesterday, and he said that Tesla is not just an idiosyncratic story, that it is a macro story, as John was mentioning earlier, because it does signal this need to cut prices and a disinflationary force. How much are you expecting to see that as a theme bleeding through some of the tech earnings that we start getting next week? Look, I do think it is a little separate from what we're gonna see next week. And maybe even if I go back to next, call a few weeks. I mean, Apple, we see iPhone demand that continues to be pretty resilient in the storm. I think cloud, when you look at Microsoft, what we're going to see out of Amazon, Google, and others, I think slight beats. Look, I think overall, we're starting to see some stabilization relative to what we saw in December and January, at least from an enterprise spend. I think in terms of tech stocks, in terms of going to earnings, it's a green light to continue to own tech. I think this earnings season is something I think more investors are ultimately going to start to then dive back into tech rather than, you know, fearing it in terms of where I believe are fundamentals starting to stabilize. Uh, Dan, dive back in. Talk to me about year to date. What do you think people have been doing already? They've ripped. It, no, no, no doubt. But I think from an institutional perspective, still many hate the rally. Many, I think, on the sidelines, ultimately sort of betting against tech, and I, which is our view. 
you know, we could see tech stocks up another 10% plus for the rest of the year because you look what's happened in terms of numbers that are starting to stabilize. They already ripped the Band-Aid off on guidance. And I think big tech, specifically when I look at FANG names, look at names like Apple, Google, Amazon. And I think these are stocks that could be up 15 20% for the rest of the year. You know, led by Apple. Well, you mentioned the cloud story. Can we just build on that a little bit more? There was obviously massive pull forward in demand for a range of things across this whole spectrum through the pandemic. Dan, I just wonder how much the cloud story has become much more of a cyclical issue now for some of these companies. What's your view on that, Dan? Well, I think we'll see with Microsoft, you know, with what comes out of Redmond on Tuesday. I think the big issue is that a lot of companies, you know, budgets were not set. But they're, in the, they're halfway through massive cloud deployments. So now you're starting to see more and more. Only 45% of workloads are in the cloud. So that, I believe, goes to 70% next two years. And I think that's why names like Microsoft continue to sort of see shared gains versus the likes of Amazon. And I think Google's another one that continues to see success. But I think ultimately, I mean, these are rock and Gibraltar sectors in terms of where I've seen cloud, cybersecurity, which is why we're bullish going into earnings. What about disappointments? We were speaking earlier with Luke Kawa, and he said that if there is some kind of earnings disappointment, it will be punished disproportionately because his sense is people are waiting for the cash behemoths to continue to be cash behemoths. Do you agree? Oh, no doubt. And also, never underestimate just how bad a management team could be or overestimate how good. That's why you have tacticians like Cook and Nadella and others on one side. But you're going to see, especially in Smith Kaplan, I mean, the, it's almost a fork in the road where you're going to see weak hands play out. I think there is still some froth. And I think, you know, this is ultimately really going to be, I think, a defining earnings season for winners and losers. But I believe I almost view it as a stock picker's market, which is why you know, I've really enjoyed this year in terms of just the way tech's playing out. Uh, you know, especially as we go into earnings season. Dan, you got Lisa excited. There was a glimmer of bearishness there. Can you build on that? <laughs> what are you bearish about, Dan? Oh, it's not. I'm just, what I'm saying is this is not a roses and rainbow and champagne macro. So ultimately, you're going to see weak hands fall by the wayside. Competition is going to continue to increase. But ultimately, that's why I think you got to pick the right stocks. It's not necessarily a basket approach. And I think that's what we're going to see play out continue during earnings season. But I think when it comes to large cap tech, when it comes to high quality tech, cybersecurity, cloud, I just continue to view that as a green light going into earnings. OK. Dan Ives of Wedbush. Dan, no doubt we'll touch base over the next couple Thanks, of weeks Sam. when we get those earnings. Thank you, sir. Amazon, Microsoft, Google, I think all next week. And then after that, I think Apple early May, right? Yep. In a couple of weeks' time. Yep, correct. And I was looking through it. You know, the bifurcation between also uh, some of the social media stocks and the others, I wonder how much China gets mentioned in some of these, whether, you know, you hear Meta come out and say, well, you know, we're doing OK. But listen, when TikTok goes under or when TikTok has to be sold, we are going to crush it. I mean, how much is that going to be sort of the underpinning of some of the uh, discussion? The stock is up close to 80 <laughs> percent. It's up 77 percent year to date, Meta. The year of efficiency, is it? Yeah. For Mark Zuckerberg. How much is it the year of potential competitive advantage because of geopolitical issues? I mean, seriously, because you saw a huge uh, pop, not only with Meta, but also in Snap. That said, we did see results from Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, and it was disappointing. And that is one of the main chip makers for Apple goods. So where's the signal in terms of some of these uh, chip makers that have not seen necessarily the dark clouds fully roll away? So you mentioned China. There is going to be a conversation, I believe, based on recent reporting, that the president's going to announce something about curbing investment in China. So Anne-Marie's going to join us in about 25 minutes from now to discuss that. Also, exclusive reporting here at Bloomberg, the president may announce his re-election run officially been waiting for this one, haven't we, for a, a couple of months? Yes. I mean, Didn't Ron Klain say after the holidays? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> look, we've been waiting for this. It's April. Why now? What's the tenor of it going to be? Is this because the former President Trump is ramping up his advertising campaign, as maybe. you can see? Well, maybe Klain was right. I just thought, and we just thought he meant Christmas, and he meant Easter. Like after. <laughs> and no one knew. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. It's coming, apparently. Mm -hmm. Maybe as mm -hmm. soon as next week. AMH. 20 minutes away. We'll also catch up with Priya Misra of TD up next. Equity futures down about two tenths of 1% from New York. This is Bloomberg.
This is a frustrating market for both bulls and bears. We're still dealing with the echoes of the crisis, which are going to slow the economy, hit the banking sector, and make the recession even more likely as the year ticks forward. We haven't really seen U.S. growth deteriorate that much yet. I think there's still a lot of lingering concerns over credit tightening. We have to keep in mind that tightening access to credit and tightening financial conditions is exactly what the Fed has been trying to do. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures down by about two tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. Over the last couple of days on the S&P, we've gone without gains on the S&P 500. Will we make that day three for the Federal Reserve? They are one day away from a quiet period. Zip it. No more talking <laughs> at all until the next Fed meeting, which is on May 2nd, May 3rd. That decision expected to be an interest rate hike. After that, the guidance is pretty clear. President Bostic, let the restrictive action work its way through. President Harker, let monetary policy do its work. We're going to hear so much more of this over the next few weeks, aren't we? It's all fancy ways of saying it. we're going to pause, right? We're going to hike one more time and then we're going to stay there and we're going to stay there for a while and we're going to see what happens. And people basically take that as, all right, that means you're going to cut rates and basically it's over. And, I, and how do they push back against that with signaling that they are more patient, that to your point, they still view the risks of inflation as significant despite some signs of disinflation? So we can just focus on the earnings. Bank earnings early this week, the smaller names, tech coming up next week, then on to May you get Apple. Just some of the dates for you if you want to jot them down. May 4th for Apple. Microsoft, April 25th. Google, April 25th. Amazon, April 27th. All of that, Lisa, coming up next week. Which is going to be really important. I do wonder whether we see the same kind of price pressures that we saw for Tesla. Dan Ives saying he doesn't think that that's going to be the case. And yet we have seen some reports in terms of chip makers that are showing some slower demand. Still, uh, that said, how much are there going to be winners and losers? I keep going back to that. You know, Dan Ives saying this is going to be a pivotal earnings season and really determine who is going to get stronger from this period and who is not. And I think that that's what we heard from Lukawa as well. Well, let's talk about winners and losers and talk about Tesla. So Tesla's been cutting prices of vehicles over the last few months, most of this year. I've lost count how many times. I think it was close to four. Let's go with four. Was it four? I think it's four. I don't know. You're going to anyway, ask the that. effort was <laughs> to cut prices, to increase volume, take market share, Sacrifice profitability. Stock got hammered yesterday off the back of some of this. This morning, we get price hikes on two very specific models, the Model S and X vehicles here in the United States. The stock is up by a half of 1%. Who are the winners and the losers of price cuts over at Tesla? Initially, based on the price action, the takeaway for a lot of the Tesla bulls, obviously, but for many other people as well, was that their price cuts are everyone else's problem. Yesterday, did it become Tesla's problem too? Well, how much does Tesla have to be treated like a car manufacturing instead of a moonshot? And that, I think, with valuation, it really hints at a valuation story more than it does its dominance in the electric vehicle uh, industry. You heard from Ford earlier this morning that this is going to become their problem too because you could get a race to the bottom and their margins are a lot smaller than Tesla's margins. But here we are in a scenario where we're questioning valuations. This isn't about necessarily survival or existential angst. And that has to do with Tesla and that has to do with regional banks and it has to do more broadly with a lot of market stories. Here's one investor group for you, a Tesla investor group, a coalition of 17 shareholders who hold more than $1.5 billion of Tesla stock. Now compare that to the overall market cap of Tesla, and you can figure out pretty quickly that that's not a great deal of stock that they hold, but it's significant enough that we should have a conversation about it. A group of Tesla investors has accused the company of mismanagement and are seeking a meeting with its board to discuss the performance of the CEO, Elon Musk. There is some concern here, obviously, Lisa, that maybe he is distracted because he's overcommitted across too many companies. He's always been a key man risk. We hear this every earnings season, whether it's him smoking pot on a call with uh, you know, investors or a call uh, online, or whether it's him uh, making inroads in a whole host of other companies. His rock star status has always been a point of angst for the company, but also a driving force. At this point, though, how much is he just basically real time trying to price out the market in a way that is perhaps more transparent than some of the other vehicle makers and some of the other manufacturers? This is according to an open letter they sent to the chairwoman and to one director. They want the board to come up with a plan and seek to remove directors too closely tied to the CEO. I don't think these issues are new, are they? No. At all. They've been around for a long, long time. 
This has always been an issue. It perhaps is more pressing because of the number of different companies. I think this is all just, what are you doing? We want to have more clarity at your strategy, and I think a lot of people are hoping for that. Stock is positive seven-tenths of 1%. The broader equity market on the S&P 500 down about a quarter of 1%. If we can just touch base, take a snapshot of the bond market briefly, yields lower by a single basis point. No drama here, Bramo. 352 on a 10-year. We've been getting our regional bank earnings throughout the morning, throughout the week, including regionals financial earlier at around 6 a.m. We get H8 Fed data on commercial banking at 4.15 p.m. This will be important. It's sort of the drumbeat to May 8th when we get the senior loan officer survey to get a sense of deposits and loans created. We get 9.45 a.m. in the U.S., the S&P Global Manufacturing and Services PMIs, as well as the composite reading. We got earlier this morning the European read. The composite looked good. Completely different story whether you're looking at services which beat or manufacturing which missed. This has been the story. How long does this continue? And to Alan Ruskin's point of Deutsche Bank, does this mean that inflation is going down faster than people expected or that it's going to be stickier? I mean, really, again, choose your narrative and you can plug in the numbers to basically back it up at this point. 4.35 p.m., the last gasp before quiet. Fed Governor Lisa Cook is speaking at Georgetown University. I'm more curious less about uh, how much they're going to hike rates and much more about what the threshold is for them to start cutting. How high is that bar? How much are they looking for economic weakness? Is it an employment number? Is it something more specific with respect to core inflation getting down to a certain level and having to stay there for a specific period of time? John? The question has certainly shifted away from how far are they going to hike to how far will they cut? Priya Misra joins us now, Head of Global Rate Strategy at TD Securities. Priya, let's start with the economic data. It's changed since we last spoke. It started to weaken. That process seems to be continuing. Do you expect it to, to accelerate in the coming months? We do. I mean, the Fed's still hiking. QT is still ongoing. Long and real rates are high. And now you've got the bank uh, tightening lending standards. I guess our view is this is not an idiosyncratic mismanagement of a few banks. This is going to have long lasting issues. We think deposits continue to fly out of, of banks into money market funds. Um, and so the banks are going to have to cut lending standards. You know, even if you ignore the CRE issue, I think uh, as lending slows down, our view is it's going to accelerate. But it's a really tricky time for the market because things are slowing. I don't think I can point to any data right now and say, here's the recession. But we think it is going to happen. I think that speed of the uh, of the decline, particularly in high frequency data, is what we're looking at. Um, in our view, it is going to accelerate into the second half. We see a recession in the fourth quarter. But really, I think you have to be nimble because the data is just slowing. I think it's not obvious right now, but but uh, we do think it's all the signs point towards uh, this accelerating. Um, into the end of the year. Priya, I'd love your take on Alan Ruskin's comments with respect to uh, the divergence that we see with respect to manufacturing and services. He says that this is a sign that if the Fed pauses, they may have to hike again later on as some of the distortions from the pandemic era buildup of inventory starts to work itself through. Do you agree that there actually is a risk here signaled by this divergence of inflation that's stickier and remains much higher than, uh, than people expect? So I agree that inflation is likely to be more sticky. We think there are structural factors, demographics, you know, onshoring, et cetera. Um, you know, but I would say in, uh, manufacturing is a more cyclical industry. Manufacturing typically slows down before services. Services have been strong because the consumers have a saving buffer and monetary policy works with a lag. Our view is manufacturing is actually a harbinger for the fact that services is going to slow down. As that savings buffer comes down and I can't really max out my credit card and I can't get another credit card, I think that's when consumer spending starts to slow down. So our view is that the Fed is going to be torn, really torn between inflation north of 2%, but the unemployment rate starting to rise. I think we don't know their pain threshold. Is it 4%? Is it 45 Is it 5 I think the market's going to grapple with that for the rest of the year. But I actually think that services is going to slow down. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 hiking again, I think that well, we should be talking about that in 2025. I think first they're going to have to cut rates. They're going to have to take rates into accommodative territory, which is not priced in. We're still pricing in a trough rate above 3% on Fed funds. If the economy is in a recession at the end of this year, I think we'll be talking about how low they are going rather than stopping around 3%. Priya, this is pretty incredible at a time when a lot of people don't think the Fed is ever going to go back to the ultra low rates that we saw pre-pandemic. Are you saying that zero or even half a percent or one percent is very much on the table for a Fed funds rate. So I look at real rates. I think real rates should probably be closer to zero or negative. You know, if inflation is going to be three percent next year or 
heaven forbid, 4% next year, you know, then how low can the Fed go in terms of nominal rates? Perhaps two, one. You know, but I do think if the uh, if the unemployment rate is rising, we see it peaking at five and a half next year. It's very similar to what happened after the savings and loan crisis. If you get that much weakening in the labor market, the Fed has to take real rates negative. So I don't know about zero or QE, but can they get to 2% on Fed funds? I think that would be our base case, two, two and a half, at least get rates that low. And the market's not pricing that in. So I think we should keep an eye on inflation clearly, but those real rates. And real rates right now are well in restrictive territory. I think that's what we'll be watching, how much the Fed cuts. But right now they're in a bind. I don't think they can signal any near-term cuts. So our view is that they start later in terms of rate cuts. They're going to be pulled in, as we call it, kicking and screaming into rate cuts. But when they start that cutting, they're going to be much more aggressive than the market's pricing in. Priya, just awesome to get your perspective as always. Priya Misra there of TD Securities Thanks. looking for 5.5% unemployment next year. Next year, 5.5% unemployment in America. The Federal Reserve's at 4.6. In 2024, they're at 4.6 on unemployment in 2025. Matt Lazzetti at Deutsche Bank talked about this a little bit earlier this week. And he said the bank struggles to forecast unemployment that's too high because it implies they might be doing something wrong and also went as far as saying it could be self-fulfilling and could lead to something bad. He basically said they don't have the luxury of saying what they think is going to happen just objectively as passive participants because they are active and they're actually uh, having to control the message a bit in order to signal a certain degree of confidence or a certain uh, degree of steadiness that they want the market to follow, which again goes to the point that you made of just sort of the George Soros type of, uh, of self-fulfilling prophecy. But this really is the bind for the Federal Reserve that is trying to signal something but also retain its credibility from an economics perspective at a time when the message they're sending is somewhat bitter. They can shape the events they anticipate Correct. to some degree, to some extent. Neil Dutter of Renaissance Macro is going to join us a little bit later on this morning. Look out for that conversation. To Neil's point, there's no in-between here. Either the Fed stays where they are or they're going to cut way more than you think they're going to cut. Coming up next, we're going to catch up with Anne-Marie Hordern down in Washington, D.C. The latest from Jordan Fabian, Mario Parker and Josh Wingrove down in Washington. President Biden looking at formally launching his re-election campaign as early as next week. That conversation up next. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's deputy, Dominic Raab, has quit after an investigation into bullying complaints. The probe criticized Raab's behavior towards civil servants. It's a major blow to Sunak. He's tried to present his government as a contrast to the Boris Johnson era, which was marked by political scandals. Federal Reserve officials are backing another interest rate increase. At the same time, they're monitoring the economic fallout from stresses on the banking system. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester says she favors getting rates above 5% because inflation is still too high. Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic says he backs a one-and-done rate hike approach. President Biden will crack down on U.S. investment in key parts of China's economy. Bloomberg's learned he'll sign an executive order in the coming weeks that will limit investing in Chinese semiconductors, artificial intelligence and quantum computing. The president's hoping to get the backing of its G7 partners. And Elon Musk is doing an about face. After saying he would continue to drop the price of his EVs, Tesla is now increasing the cost of its Model S and X vehicles in the U.S. Prices for the high-end models will be bumped up by $2,500, raising the cost of the sedan and SUV by 2% to 3%. Steep markdowns earlier this year took a toll on profitability and Tesla shares. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. National security is of paramount importance in our relationship with China. Even though these policies may have economic impacts, they are driven by straightforward national security considerations. And we will not compromise on these concerns, even when they force trade-offs with our economic interests. 
A landmark speech from the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on the relationship between the United States and China. National security concerns trumping economic interests. The latest today from Jenny Leonard, our colleague down in Washington. President Biden aiming to sign an executive order in the coming weeks that will limit investment in key parts of China's economy by American businesses. We'll pick up on that story in Washington in just a moment. The broader price action this morning looks like this. We're down two-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Softer this morning, just a touch softer through the week. No real drama. A couple of days without gains on the S&P 500. In the bond market, yields not doing much on a 10-year 353. In the FX market, pretty much unchanged as well. A bit of a snooze going into the weekend so far. 109.72 on the euro against the US dollar. Joining us now, I'm pleased to say down in Washington, our Washington correspondent Amory joins us. AMH, I want to start with this, the report from our colleagues that maybe next week is the week where the president announces officially that he's running. Well, the president had said in Ireland that relatively soon he'll be making that announcement. And we've seen everyone in his inner circle, and most importantly, including the first lady, Dr. Joe Biden, come out and said, of course, he is running. But he's making this announcement potentially next week. Nothing is set in stone in a video that would be released. So potentially this is also even a soft launch because it is, doesn't seem like it's going to be a massive, huge campaign event if this is just a video with the president saying once again, he is running and his intent is to run, but he will start also taking meetings with donors. So it does look like they are trying to set the scene. There's been a lot of debate about whether or not he should get should announce for 2024 officially as soon or put it off because he is the president of the United States. And once he announces, he becomes not just President Joe Biden, but also n potential nominee for 2024. And what, then he's a candidate. But what's the calculus here, Anne-Marie? Why does it matter in terms of exactly when he decides to run and what that could signal? So some of the calculus, of course, they want to be able to set up these donor meetings and make sure they can get campaign staffing in place, um, make sure they're going to have a campaign manager. And it does seem like he probably is under some pressure within the Democratic Party because obviously those whispers are, are still circulating about whether or not this should be the individual to lead them into the future. Remember, at 80 years old right now, he is the oldest U.S. president. And if he takes a, takes the U.S. Uh, Democratic Party into 2024, he will be 86 at the end of that term. So obviously his age has been a big concern um, and they're probably under some pressure to, you know, make that decision and and start looking at it as the Republican race is uh, for who's going to be their candidate is clearly heating up. And Marie, the, as he talks about this, he's clinging on to the bipartisan agreed upon uh, kind of talking point of how to deal with China right now. And we heard that uh, the Biden administration is planning to unleash some provisions about restrictions on U.S. investment in China. Do we have any sense of what those might look like and whether it's currently being expected by people in the market? We don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but it will probably start targeting those uh, investments into companies or technologies that can advance Chinese military. The same way you're seeing advanced technologies that the U.S. curb in terms of the export controls. One thing this administration has really tried to do is make sure they can gain the support of allies as they try to confront China on this economic basis, which is why you see potentially this is going to be a huge story at the G7, which Biden will be attending in Hiroshima in Japan. He wants to make sure other countries are looking at similar ways to curb investment into China so they're not going at it alone. But we still are waiting for some details on this. But obviously it comes at a time when tensions continue to ratchet between Beijing and Washington, and so much of this has to do with what's going on in Taiwan. Well, never mind tensions between Beijing and Washington. Let's talk about Paris and Washington. When you go to that G7, what's the president say to the French leader about this push? Well, they had a phone call yesterday, and a readout came that they obviously talked about China and uh, maintaining a safe and independent Taiwan Strait. Uh, for me, Reading the tea leaves, this phone call potentially was maybe a talking to to President Emmanuel Macron to make sure they are on the same page. What you've seen French officials do is really try to walk back and tone down some of that rhetoric we heard from Emmanuel Macron. But 
it's going to be uh, slightly awkward because he obviously said these things. He talked about Europe not becoming a vassal between U.S. and China. He talked about strategic autonomy, talked about not wanting to decouple from China. Uh, the issue Emmanuel Macron has, though, is that he doesn't have the backing of his European allies on this. Um, many European leaders and officials were uncomfortable with the comments Macron has made, not just those in the United States. Wasn't there a diplomatic spat very early on in the administration under President <laughs> Biden over submarines and some tension between the French and the United States back then as well? Well, potentially this is something that the Australians maybe saw and underscores the reason why they ditched France for the partners they uh, took on in the end for these nuclear submarines, which is the United Kingdom, the United States, and that deal is called AUKUS. We recently saw Prime Minister Albanese, as well as Rishi Sunak, alongside the president in California, talking about these submarines. Um, and yes, there's been a few spats between Paris and Washington throughout this administration. Um, but this is a, a little bit also of how Emmanuel Macron likes to have his diplomacy, right? We saw him um, go speak to Putin a number of times when others were a bit concerned that he wasn't going to be able to make a breakthrough. He's almost trying to do the same thing with Xi Jinping. A big part of his trip was try to get China on board to really work out a peace agreement, putting pressure on Moscow. Um, but for Xi Jinping, this was a huge coup. Emmanuel Macron's trip was a huge coup, and it also put Ursula von der Leyen, who was there with him, in a very difficult position. Yeah, I have to say, I forgot she was even there, Anne-Marie. Yep. Did, did anything come I out know. from her side whatsoever? Uh, really, everything was overshadowed by Emmanuel Macron. That is what the Chinese government wanted to push forward, and then, obviously, <laughs> it wasn't just the trip, but the interview he gave to French journalists and Politico on his way back uh, that created really even more tension and drama. MH, thank you. Wonderful to get some clarity from you down in Washington. Tune in to Balance of Power for more clarity a little bit later on this evening, 5 p.m. Eastern Time. AMH, Joe Matthew, speaking to Kay Bailey Hutchinson, the former U.S. ambassador to NATO. No doubt some of these issues are going to come up. Some of these leaders, Bramo, they love playing the statesman, don't they? They're desperate for it. Macron's one, Trudeau's another. You know, those kind of personalities that just want to be seen on the international stage saying big things. Right, exactly, like deal maker and sort of, you know, bringing together the powers while, while their their world burns. I mean, this is sort of the, the, the sort of uh, theory and, and the pushback that Emmanuel Macron got. I think it's interesting, though, that we did not get anything from Ursula von der Leyen that was memorable. I forgot she was there. Exactly. I think that's actually really telling at a time when even Germany, yes, they acknowledge the potential risk from China. That economy cannot decouple right now from China. If you look at their auto manufacturers, they are entirely reliant and purchases in China. That is pretty much consistent across the board. How much is that what's underpinning the strength that we're seeing in Europe? And so how much is Emmanuel Macron saying the quiet part out loud? Well, never mind German autos. French luxury. Yeah. No LVMH. Doubt. Exactly. Can LVMH decouple from China? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I don't think so. Which is, again, the quiet part out loud. How much is Emmanuel Macron actually representing what a lot of companies feel, not only in Europe, yes. but also in the U.S.? I had this issue with Russia. Do you remember the lead-up to the war? The Italian business lobby, do you remember that? They were still holding meetings. Yeah. And yeah, you know, business in Europe wanted to keep those ties. And I imagine they're going to want to keep those ties with China regardless of what happens. Which is why I think it'll be interesting to see what actually we get from the Biden administration in terms of curbs, what the meat is behind Janet Yellen saying that national security comes before economic interest. Dan Suzuki of Richard Bernstein is going to join us next. Looking forward to that conversation. He's pushed back against this rally in the tech sector. He thinks it's time for a change of leadership. We're going to have that conversation in just a moment. Your equity market, negative two-tenths of 1%. This is Bloomberg. Equity's negative here on the S&P 500, down 0.2% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, down four-tenths of 1%. Softer here in the equity market. In the bond market, we look a little something like this on a two-year. Your yield, north of 4% through all of this week, 4.12% right now, down a couple of basis points on a two-year. Down a lot more just yesterday off the back of softer than anticipated data. Jobless claims a little bit higher. Fully Fed not looking too decent. And the Fed just encouraging one more hike and then saying pause. We're done through the rest of this year. That was overwhelmingly the consensus view from the Fed officials we heard from yesterday, and I think we heard from at least six of them 
in just 24 hours. They go into the quiet period tomorrow, so no more Fed speak until the Fed decision on May 3rd. Then on to the ECB on May 4th. So let's get to the euro. The euro backing away from 110.76 this time last week to 109.73 this morning. Totally unchanged. Lisa, some snoozy price action to close out the week. Yeah. And it's honestly interesting that it's snoozy because there's a lot under the surface, but it really speaks to this lack of conviction that everybody has. And we hear it from everybody who comes on the show. If you want to look for conviction, it's in the uh, recession in manufacturing that continues. And that's sort of what I'm focused on. First of all, Tesla, those shares are up a whole half percent after uh, perhaps a bit of an about face by Elon Musk saying that he was going to raise prices on Model S and Model X uh, vehicles in the U.S. after multiple price cuts. The, share, the uh, shares rebounding just a touch, but yesterday they were absolutely pummeled on the idea of yet another price cut, really raising questions about whether we end up in this sort of disinflationary spiral that is more broadly applicable to a wider range of companies. You're seeing that in big lots, perhaps in Overstock.com, furniture providers, and Piper Sandler put out a note downgrading both of them in light of a lack of demand for home furnishing. I wonder if this is also a specific set of home furnishing, if this continues to be the K-shaped recovery for people who are looking for, you know, sort of a medium and low income uh, furnishings rather than the highest income, which continues to produce uh, some returns. Overstock down almost 3 percent, Big Lots down more than 6 percent. Remember when Overstock had this huge pop? I'm just mentioning crypto assets and mentioning Bitcoin in their release. I mean, you talk about, you know, a complete about face for some of the names where you see froth being taken out from markets and market narratives at a time when these shares are already down by, I believe, about 30 percent so far this year. Now it's AI. You just have to put AI in your name. Do you remember chat, that? I remember that. Was overstock? it 2017? Yeah. 2017, late 2017, something like that, when everyone just started putting... Crypto okay. things in their names. Yeah, and then every and then their shares would absolutely surge. Long Island Ice Tea was that one of the names? Something like that. Do you remember <laughs> yes. that ticker? I, I mean, remember there were, there were some ridiculous that was, stories. That was insanity. But, and 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 so now the question is, okay, that's dead, right? And that's not going to really do anything or prop up your share price. Do you think AI will work? You think you say like you know chat overstock? Oh yeah. Dot com? Put GBT on the end of anything, stock goes up for sure. You mentioned some of the higher end players, William Sonoma is positive on the year by about six percent. Restoration Hardware though negative by. 8%. The real test, if you go around the corner and go to design within reach, ask them how business is. Because things there cost a fortune. Yes, it's really nice like, stuff, though. I know, but I really just like to look stuff. at I know. To look it's at like the $5,000 chair. Sit in it. Yeah. Enjoy it for that the if afternoon. you bought, you'd never actually sit in because you'd be too scared of breaking <laughs> you put, it. put like plastic on it. I don't know if I'm going to go that far. But I do think that you do see that K-shape recovery. I mean, we talk about Hermes and LVMH and you talk about uh, William Sonoma doing better. And then some of these others. Is that sort of a sign of what we're seeing on the margins for people who have to pay attention to discretionary Are you income? the kind of person that buys a sofa and put, puts plastic? on top of <laughs> no i'm you not make, you make those i'm not kind of from moves. 1946 in okay. long island i'm just asking is that what they did in 1946 in long island plastic <laughs> over sofas I don't know. we'll ask tom when he's back <laughs> dan suzuki deputy cio at richard bernstein advisors joins us now to talk about some of the earnings in this equity market dan great to catch up with you sir let's just start with earnings season so far early days you know the arc of it you start with the financials you shift the tech next week what's the takeaway so far for you and the team dan yeah, obviously, Jonathan, it's still very early in earnings season. But so far, I think the takeaway is very clear that growth continues to slow uh, and that continues to pressure prof profits and put us further into this earnings recession that we've already been in. I think that's the big takeaway. Nothing's collapsing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of fears of, you know, the 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 carryover from the banking crisis and things were going to fall apart. That's not the case, but things continue to get worse. And from an operating leverage perspective, you know, that benefit that helped companies over the last couple of years is now really starting to bite. And we're starting to see them cut costs. Meta going through the year of efficiency, so to speak, making cuts. The stock is up by 77 percent. We've talked about this before, Dan. I know it's a subject you're focused on. Can they cut costs quick enough? No, I don't think so, uh, Jonathan, and, and I think that's uh, very evident in the data. Uh, you know, you look at these companies, you know, the, when have you seen companies proactively cut their workforce, you know, to keep up with falling top line growth uh, such that their margins are expanding? You know, that's the hope here, um, but that's rarely the case. If growth continues to slow, I think that's going to continue to hurt them more uh, than they can, than they can make, it up, make up for. Uh, on the operating line. So we're talking about tech as a sort of holistic group. And Dan Ives earlier this morning was talking about how this is going to be a defining earnings season of winners and losers, a consolidation of market share and power. And you'll see that reflected in the shares. Do you disagree? 
Well, I think to some extent, you know, that's absolutely right. I mean, look at think about the the word tech. Uh, it, it kind of is kind of less and less meaningful at this point. You know, from an investor sentiment perspective, I think it's very meaningful. But at the end of the day, you know, tech is part of everything now, right? That's why they keep reclassifying, you know, the indices because you know you have to m move more to thinking about tech in terms of those end markets, and those end markets do have different demand drivers. So I think you will see. You know, different quarter to quarter, there will be differences in timing uh, and the fundamentals. And so there will be opportunities for stock pickers. But I think ultimately, when you look holistically at tech, you know, the reality is that people got so excited about all these companies and they all got they all benefited, you know, from this what turned into a bubble. And as that deflates and as people realize, you know, there's more to the world than wiener dogs in the metaverse, as my boss likes to say, you know, then then you have to focus on real things and real assets. I could go a lot of places with that, but let's just stick on the tech theme and what we expect from next week, given the fact that we potentially could get some sort of tipping point in terms of sentiment, how these really are such dominant players in the index. Do you think that this will be a make it or break it kind of earnings season, not only for the tech players, but more broadly, if those shares really do sell off? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, if you if you back into it that way and say if these stocks really sell out, then then I think by definition it's going to be a make or break quarter. But uh, I think you know when I think about it, I think make or break quarter is probably the wrong way to think about it. Uh, you know, I think as you've seen over the last couple quarters, you know, their fundamentals continue to deteriorate. They get further into you know negative earnings growth. Yet you know they've clearly had some rallies along the way, and I think that. Um, you know, it's just it's sort of the the compounding of worse and worse, you know, fundamental data to the point where you just can't justify, you know, the valuations, which for the tech sector are now like 25 times. And, you know, I think at some point, you know, you, you real the market source to start to come back to reality. But make or break quarters, put, putting a lot of pressure on one print. I think it's going to be the com combination of you know their earnings fundamentals combined with what's happening in the macro economy. You put it all together. The timing, you know, doesn't come out to the day you know they report earnings. Dan, one theme that I think we need to build on just a little bit more. Some of these names, particularly in tech, were considered defensive through much of the last decade, flattered by where interest rates were, I know. But one of the reasons a lot of people used to say that, Dan, was because they had these secular tailwinds, which were somewhat divorced from the cycle. Dan, do you still see it quite the same way as other people did over the last 10 years? Or are they far more cyclical, more sensitive to the cycle than perhaps some people are letting on? Well, I think if you, if you just, you know, dispassionately look at the data, even over the last decade when they were considered defensive, you know, you look at their earnings sensitivity. If you put COVID aside, you know, where, you know, they, a lot of these companies actually did, you know, benefit from an earnings perspective, you know, as the world was, as the economy was collapsing, you put that aside almost every single cycle, you know, they've been some of the most, their earnings have been some of the most sensitive, you know, to that cyclicality. So I think that nothing has changed there. We're not saying it's, it's worse or it's better, people just underappreciate, especially since their last example, you know, the recency bias is the pandemic. They are very cyclical companies. I mean, just think, just fundamentally think about it. If we go into a recession, we go into a major slowdown, people will buy, be buying less $100,000 EV cars. People will be buying less, you know, $1,500 to $2,000, you know, phones. People will be buying less streaming services, et cetera, et cetera. That's just a normal cycle. Um, so all, we're not saying anything profound. We're just saying you should expect normal things to occur. Has it been frustrating for you, Dan, that the fundamentals have really borne out a lot of your theses, but the market action hasn't really? Uh, I, I think that's to be expected. I mean, our our point uh, to investors has been that bubbles don't deflate overnight. If you go back, you know, to the deflation of the internet bubble, it took two and a half years. And, and along the way, you had so many rallies, you know, 16 different double digit rallies, two of which were over 50 percent. Uh, I think, you know, that's to be expected. You know, people love these these parts of their portfolios, they dominate their portfolios. You know, they're not going to go out without a fight. And so I think that, you know, the the at every opportunity of, of optimism, people are going to rush back into things. And I think that's that's always been the case. That's what history, you know, has borne out. And so I think, you know, actually looking away for the real opportunities out there that are underappreciated and underlooked, the ones that have underperformed. Granted, they've underperformed for over a decade. You know, those will probably be the bigger opportunities over the coming decade. Hey, Dan, appreciate the update from you, the team, as always. Thank you, sir. Dan Suzuki there of Richard Bernstein Advisors. The call so far this week, 
it's a process, not an event. Seems to be the trend, doesn't it, whether we're talking about this, tech stocks, or the financials and what's going to happen with financial conditions. Markets don't like processes. No, they want it all at once on Correct. TV, special programming. Exactly. If they want a Sunday night One special. Hour special. Exactly. Let's go. And just to tell Price us what we can all expect. At once. <laughs> and it's just not going to be delivered that way. So, how do you remain patient when you can tell a fundamental story that's borne out by facts and yet. It's not reflected in the market action. It's, you know, the reason why we've got this sort of malaise setting in of just oh, range bound. You nailed it, though, Lisa. The most frustrating thing, and Dan played it down, it's so frustrating to nail the macro call and then get the market call wrong. Luke Carra was talking to us from UBS a little bit earlier this morning, and that's the conversation I had with him. Fantastic call from the team at the start of the year over at UBS. And then text just ripped. And, and the tech ripping part of it just wasn't a feature of the overall call. This is the reason why this is such a difficult market, because every time you try to look at the fundamentals and come up with a story, you know, you get, I don't know, in Wall Street parlance, your face ripped off. I mean, it just is a very difficult uh, moment. And, and I think that that's really what the Fed is facing as well. And so people who are looking to the Fed for guidance have gotten frustrated with the lack thereof. And now we have from Andrew Hollenhorst that they're now just going to be wordlessly watching. I saw that. I love I that phrase. That. I actually really enjoy that. He said that they're going to be upgrading growth and inflation forecasts in the June projections. Do you see that line? Yep. Well, That's I mean, this what he expects from the Fed. Andrew Hollenhorst has been really consistent with uh, expecting rates to be a lot higher than a lot of people think and uh, expressing that inflationary inputs are bigger than many expect. Hollenhorst at City looking for hikes in May, June and July. And by the way, I'm so pleased that Dan Suzuki said what he said about the pandemic. That was not a cyclical test for those tech companies. Just wasn't. Quite the opposite. Have these tech companies in their current form ever had a cyclical test? That's a different kind of conversation. Neil Dutter of Renmac. Now, he has been constructive on this economy in a way that other people have not. An update from Neil in the next hour. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, complaints by government workers have brought down Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's close ally. Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab resigned after an independent investigation criticized his treatment of civil servants. The probe into accusations of bullying lasted months, and it threatened to undermine Sunak's pledge to restore professionalism in the government. The U.S. wants to cut its dependence on Taiwan's microchips because of concerns that China might invade the island. Now Taiwanese officials are quietly urging their American counterparts to turn down the rhetoric. They are worried that U.S. comments are harming their business interests. President Biden may formally launch his re-election campaign as early as next week. The president's aides have planned for the possibility of making a video announcement to coincide with the anniversary of his previous campaign launch. He's been signaling that he intends to seek a second term next year, making it somewhat of an open secret. In the UK, two insurers have become the first major companies to quit the Confederation of British Industry. And that follows a report involving allegations of a second case of rape at the business lobbying group. Aviva and Phoenix Group have canceled their memberships. Aviva says the CBI is no longer able to represent corporate Britain. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. The United States will assert ourselves when our vital interests are at stake, but we do not seek to decouple our economy from China's. A full separation of our economies would be disastrous for both countries. It would be destabilizing for the rest of the world. Janet Yellen there, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, offering her view in a landmark speech of the relationship between the United States and China. From New York City, welcome to the program and good morning to you. Your equity market looks a little something like this on the S&P 500. We are negative by 0.2% on the S&P. Yields are doing absolutely nothing. The euro as well. The 10-year yield, 352.99. Unchanged there on a 10-year yield. Euro dollar, the euro against the US dollar, firmer by a tenth of 1% on that currency pair. So a bit of dollar strength, or rather a bit of euro strength, some dollar weakness. Euro dollar backing away from the levels of last Friday, though this time last Friday, 110.76, a new intraday high for the year on the single currency. Just sub 110 through much of this week on the euro. 
particularly this morning. And a current joins us now from Washington, D.C., the Bloomberg Global Economy correspondent, now based in Washington, with the expertise on China, as always, they remain. And so let's talk about that. We heard from the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen framing what she thinks the relationship should be between the United States and China and pointing out quite emphatically that, yes, there should be no decoupling, but ultimately security concerns are paramount. Now, Ender, I wonder how the Chinese government has responded to the comments from the Treasury Secretary just yesterday. Well, it sounds like they weren't accepting Janet Yellen's message. John, I look at some of the comments that came out of Beijing overnight. The spokesperson for the foreign ministry made the point that the U.S. is trying to choke China's economic development. In fact, they said it was economic coercion. And that's interesting because, as you mentioned, in the Treasury Secretary's speech yesterday, she seemed to go out of her way to make the point, look, we're willing to take a hit here, an economic hit on national security grounds when it comes to competition with China. But she also stressed it wasn't about trying to contain China. And a lot of people were sceptical, of course, of whether or not that message would be received in Beijing. And obviously, judging by the comments overnight, they're not seeing it that way. They are seeing it as though uh, the U.S. is trying to ring fence China. We had some comments also from the foreign minister as well. He spoke to a, a meeting of top business, Western business executives, and he was also pushing back against some of the criticism towards China, especially around Taiwan, for example. So, you know, there was, a, there was some interpretation yesterday that Janet Yellen was being hawkish, but also maybe a hint of a middle, middle ground, some olive branch uh, in terms of where they can cooperate. But obviously Beijing is just taking it as route one. And they're saying, look, you're trying to choke our economic development. That wasn't the big surprise to me. We kind of expected them to take it that way. That's been the tit for tat that we keep hearing between the U.S. and China. What's more interesting to me, perhaps, is what the G7 response will be and that the U.S. is seeking the approval of the G7 leaders to approve some of these curbs on investment in China. What is the response like in the other members of that group, especially after signs of some division uh, on the margins with not only, uh, but most prominently, Emmanuel Macron? Yeah, absolutely, Lisa. It would be really interesting to see what kind of unity they do get among the G7 members. Like you mentioned, France obviously sending mixed signals on where exactly they are when it comes to the sort of alliance that's being built against China at the moment. Uh, China has been very active on the global stage in recent weeks, not just with G7 members, but beyond. We had that, of course, that visit from Brazil's Lula last week, talking about uh, closer alliances there. The point being, and you heard Larry Summers last week making the point that it doesn't seem like everybody is on board the US narrative when it comes to China. So this may be a harder sell than it looks for the US in terms of getting everybody on the same page, the G7 economies in particular on the same page, to agree some of these industrial uh, some of these investment curbs. We know some countries are probably uh, well on the way. Japan, for example, has been signaling it's, it's on board for this U.S. approach. But we don't know if everybody's there. And as you mentioned, at the very least, France will certainly probably have some skepticism when it comes to this. As we get into this sort of tit-for-tat back and forth and understanding where we are as the state of play, Sometimes I, I lose the plot when you zoom out and just how much has changed with China's economy and, frankly, its role geopolitically as it really befriends uh, Saudi Arabia, as it really connects uh, more closely with Russia. How, how different is now versus, say, three years ago when it comes to both of those issues? Well, I think, you know, it goes to this idea of, um, you know, the political blocks that are building around the world. The narrative a few years ago was that uh, there were genuine complaints against China on economic grounds, we'll say, on the transfer of technology, on, on fair access to the markets and everything else. There was a broad consensus uh, amongst major leading economies on that front. But as you say, now we're starting to get into this fragmentation. We have Saudi Arabia peeling away from the U.S., apparently peeling closer towards China, for example. You have the whole China-U.S., China-Russia alliance, of course, and President Xi Jinping talking about changes we haven't seen in 100 years when he, when he went to Moscow. We have Brazil and the BRICS formation, that trip by Lula to, Brazil, to Beijing last week, all reinforcing the point that there may be some unity among the U.S. and we'll say Western Europe on some of the issues when it comes to China, but there certainly isn't an overall uh, global approach to, to this issue with China. And even within the Western Europe alliance, it should be said, of course, that France is also sending signals that it has different views on it too. So I think the, the story is more complicated, the alliances are more fragmented, and it continues to change to what it was even when, say, President Biden took office a few years ago. And you've lived this now from both sides, in Hong Kong for a number of years, now in Washington, D.C. What's the difference between the way the Chinese government views the U.S. and the way the U.S. government 
views the Chinese government? I think, look, I think tension between both now is very high. I mean, once upon a time, Hong Kong would have been considered a fairly neutral playground for both. The US can do business there, China can do business there. It was a meeting of minds. That's obviously seen now as a fairly, as a geopolitical fault line, for example. I've been struck by the sense of urgency in my very short time in Washington, without getting into a hot take, but there is this idea of fragmentation and resilience and reshoring. It's absolutely very real here. I must say. And on China's side, they're obviously very determined to protect their investment, and they're going around the US now. That's why they are reaching out to Brazil, they are reaching out to Saudi Arabia, they are reaching out to Russia. They're looking to circumvent this US approach. I wanted the hot take. That's exactly what I wanted. And a thank you. And a Karen there, down in Washington. That push is real. We felt it last week as well at the IMF World Bank spring meetings. And this is why there is some pushback against this view coming out of the IMF that rates can return to their pre-pandemic levels because this push has only accelerated and this push might contribute to higher levels. I think about what Ellen Wald said a while ago when it came to a signal of global demand and to gauge the China reopening. And she said that Saudi Arabia holds the key. And Saudi Arabia is having conversations with China about how much crude they need. And that if they decide to cut some of the production, that will be the true signal that perhaps the recovery isn't as quick as people previously thought in China, because that is ultimately how closely connected these two nations are. It speaks to new alliances, and it speaks to attention of addressing that when you're kind of looking for the old economic model at the IMF, like so many people said, they seem to be trying to portray. I won't offer my hot take on this conversation about but, a wholesale shift but, around foreign exchange and the US dollar. But oh, yeah. no, I think we've got to talk about and highlight the fact that there is a push to de-emphasize the US dollar from, from, from some of these countries. Now, we can talk about the challenges from ultimately shifting away from the US dollar. We haven't got time for that. We've got about two minutes. But story after story, you see it. Story after story, you see it. And China is often at the center of it. Well, how about the idea that some of the dollar, that some of the purchases of crude were denominated in UN? This was a couple of weeks ago. There was a story, nothing massive, nothing like it was going to completely upend the market and change the currency denomination for a significant portion of purchases. But it is a sense that there is some sort of undercurrent moving to diversify away from the dollar, especially because of what happened with Russia and the dollar used. It's almost a tool of retaliation or a tool of enforcement, making people feel more vulnerable. We'll catch up with Dan Tannenbaum of Oliver Wyman and maybe bring up some of those themes to discuss. The latest this morning, just on the news front, the Russian President Vladimir Putin and Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman had a phone call a little bit earlier today and talked about OPEC plus cooperation. The two leaders expressed, quote, satisfaction with the level of coordination within OPEC plus in order to ensure the stability of the global oil market. I wonder how the White House feels about that one, Bramo. I mean, right now, the idea that Saudi Arabia is cozying up to Russia, that you could get some sort of cozying up between China and Russia with the trade data, the fact that trade had increased 135 percent between China and Russia over the past year gives you a sense of how much some of these polls are shifting. The story I think we all missed because we were drowning in financial market tension, banking stress, was the deal that had been brokered by China between Saudi and Iran. Diplomatically, that's quite a big deal. Well, yes. I mean, people saying that this was something that Saudi Arabia and Iran had wanted and it wasn't that much of a significant deal, but symbolically, you frame it exactly right. Symbolically, the fact that Saudi Arabia allowed China to try to take a victory lap as a negotiator on the world yeah. stage says a lot. Negative 0.2% on the S&P 500. Coming up shortly, Patrick Armstrong of Plurimi Wealth. We'll get his call on some of the big tech names, which report next week and the week after that. This is Bloomberg. The problem here is you've still got to get through the recession. And yes, we've all been waiting for the recession for a year now. We're not in the camp of forecasting a recession, but we still believe that U.S. growth will not be far off of zero. There has been decent momentum really all year in stocks, despite all of the headwinds. It does seem as though the Fed is right to be getting close to a pause here. Even if we did have a mild recession, I don't think they're going to cut all the way to zero. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz.
Live from New York City, getting you to the weekend. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. TK taking a long weekend. Your equity market negative two tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. The doom and gloom, the bears are not changing their views whatsoever. You heard from Julian Emanuel there of Evercore. We need to get through the recession. I'll catch up with Morgan Stanley's Lisa Shatter a little bit later on this morning. Her view, her argument, her message, do not look through the economy economic weakness. Don't look through it. You've got to experience it first, Bramo. <laughs> before you start buying. Lean into the pain, you Something know, like basically that. you're Something just like trying that. to tweak me and wind me up. Honestly, I think that this is going to be one of the big, most difficult moments where you see the uh, money, the, the monetary stimulus being pulled back continually. People talk about M2 and how it's declining. At the same time that you do see tighter lending conditions and yet people still want to spend on things. And this is really uh, the conundrum and we're going to get it at 9.45 a.m. today. Services keep coming in stronger than expected even as you see people pull back perhaps on how many desks they buy. So that in Europe, where we sit in the US, 9.45 Eastern Time, the PMIs in the United States. Busy week for financial earnings this week. On to next week, we start to hear from tech. Microsoft on the 25th, alongside Google. Amazon, April 27th, early May, May 4th. Apple, that's going to be a big focus for this market, Lisa, because some of those names have had a tremendous year so far year to date. So what have we heard? From Luke Kawa, he said that misses are going to be severely punished, right? We heard from Dan Ives, the classic bull, saying this will be a defining moment for a lot of the earnings of the haves, the have-nots. And then we heard from Dan Suzuki uh, that basically you're going to see them continue to underperform. They haven't gotten that cyclical test, and this will drag the market down potentially as people realize that there just is less demand for some of these products, I think that this will be an interesting macro test, possibly akin to what we've seen with the regional banks in terms of what people spend generally is, but not just people, also businesses with the cloud spending. Oh, without a doubt. Cloud spend for me is the standout. For years, we've talked about that as some secular tailwind. Is that now a real cyclical story? Do they start to pull back on some of that? Is that going to show up in that direction? How much can companies continue to invest in the infrastructure and building out some of these things if they're concerned about profit margins, if they're concerned about you know their intellectual security, if they're concerned about keeping the right number of employees in the right mix? This really pressures some of these industries that have been going gangbusters with free money. You mentioned Dan Suzuki. Big question. Can these companies cut costs quickly enough if the revenue line starts to drop away and he doesn't think they can? That seems to be the bottom line for him. I think it depends on which, right? I mean, I think that that sort of goes to the Dan Ives point. Are there going to be some that can, but the rest can't? And I think that we're seeing that tension right now with Tesla. And the reason why people have pointed to it so much is because they were the standout margin play. They had margins that were not akin to the auto manufacturers. Now they're getting a little closer because they're trying to gain market share. And how much is that really going to pressure their valuation in a new way? Stock got punished for that just yeah. yesterday. Margins coming in more than anticipated. This morning, we get some price hikes on certain models of Tesla. We'll touch on that story again for you a little bit later. For the broader market, quite simple, negative 0.2% on the S&P 500. No real drama here outside of equities. We're basically unchanged in the bond market through most of this morning on a 10-year 352.61 on a 10-year maturity. That's your yield right now. In the FX market, the euro essentially unchanged over the last couple of days, Lisa. 109.80 on the single currency, even off the back of that pretty tremendous services PMI data out of the eurozone. Yeah, well, honestly, again, there hasn't been much of a catalyst right now. And you talked about this earlier. I think you said it well. People are looking for that aha moment. OK, we're heading into recession now. <laughs> or, aha, it's going to be the sort of a new bull market, something. And we're not getting it. And it's just sort of this grind of little details and Fed officials being like, eh, you know, like, let's try to figure this out. Which Fed official is that? <laughs> Who sounds like that? Basically all of them. They're coming out. They're saying, you know, OK, we're going to raise. We need a little bit more. We're going to tweak our language. We're not sure. We're watching what you're watching. Maybe we'll get some insight and then we'll talk. Calling your colleagues a fall in the shower. You see that? I, I mean, come on. <laughs> That's over in Europe. If you're just tuning in and you've missed this, welcome and let me share it with you. One policymaker at the Bank of England, incredibly dovish, as you might have guessed from what she's about to say, Silvana Tenreiro, compared her hawkish colleagues to a fool in the shower who scolds himself by being too impatient to wait for the water to warm up and then bang, comes down all at once. I think we've all experienced that at some point. That's a nod to Milton Friedman. But I just wonder, can you imagine sharing the committee? with that individual. She's heading for the exit for what it's worth anyway. <laughs> well, I think maybe that that's, that's the reason why. Said, sure. Scorched earth sure. uh, kind of mentality there. But it really does. I mean, how much is the balance of risk actually shifting? And the difficulty right now is both sides of this debate can prove it with data. And that's the problem, because how do you know what's right? You'll have to know when it's too late. She's got two more meetings left. 
They will be fraught. She's going out swinging. Patrick Armstrong joins us now, CIO <laughs> at Plurimi Wealth. Patrick, what a foot to catch up with you, sir. I think we all just want an update from your standpoint on where you are and some of these tech names at the moment going into next week. Um, I own Alphabet. I own Google going into next week. And uh, so I own them. I'm comfortable with them. And I think that's where the whole world is right now. And that's one of the things that makes me scared is that if you look at the S&P 500, year to date, it's up 8.5%. Um, 10 stocks contribute 6.5% of that 8.5% return. The other 490 stocks contributed just 2% of that return. So everyone's worried about a recession. Everyone wants secular growth, defendable profit margins. And you feel really safe in these mega cap techs, um, high quality growth. And I think that's in the price now, to be honest. So I think the risk isn't that these companies miss and fall off a cliff, but they are cyclically exposed. And it may be a period of dead money where it takes a long time to catch up with the multiples that some of them are trading at now. So Alphabet, Google, I still, or Apple and Google, I still own. They're reasonable multiples. They're a little bit expensive now, whereas I think mega cap tech and quality growth is getting quite expensive. Russell, uh, 1,000 growth is now trading at 80th percentile on all the valuation measures I look at, 26 times earnings. So it's not cheap. A lot of good news and a lot of safety premium is uh, being priced in right now. You mentioned breadth, Patrick. Is narrow breadth alone a problem when we saw that repeatedly over the last decade? Well, I don't know if it's a problem, but I think a mean reversion trade is very likely because everyone's trying to hide from cyclicality, I think, in these quality growth companies. And they've moved up to 30 times earnings, some of them 35 times earnings, other kind of um, depending on the stock. And it's really important to buy a stock that's at a fair multiple for the growth it's going to deliver. And um, we just sold LVMH, which is an incredible company. I bought it in September last year when it was trading at 19 times earnings. I sold it. It's trading at 31 times trailing, 27 times forward. Um, there's just a lot of great news priced into great companies right now. If you feel safe owning it, it's probably expensive. And I think a mean reversion trade um, makes sense right now where some of the companies that have lagged that have predictable cash flows healthcare has been a terrible performer this year up until recent weeks i think that's trading at a market multiple very predictable earnings strong cash flow generation i think that's where i'd prefer to be if you are trying to hide from a recession well congratulations on cashing out lvmh with a hefty profit i want to go back to this idea of dead money that you said with some of the uh, big tech names that you think are great companies but perhaps are not going to exceed their valuations for a sustained period of time when do you decide to cash out of those and basically try your hand elsewhere versus sticking with it and just allowing the dead money to be a little bit flat um, well, it's the 30 handle that gets me a bit worried. When stocks get to 30 times earnings, I've really got to believe that they've got a way to beat the consensus because consensus is bullish. That's what's driving a 30 times uh, P multiple. So that's, for me, a level that I start to get a bit worried that everything's in the price. Um, the companies where I'm outright short aren't the big cap quality growth, so I still own some of them. But companies like Delivery Hero, um, SoftBank has a bunch of these companies that have no path to profitability. Neo, uh, Rivian. Um, I don't see a path to profitability, and they're still trading at billions of market cap. And those are the stocks that I think are really at risk. Um, the market's convinced the Fed is going to be cutting in the second half of this year. If that happens, that allows multiples to drift higher. But a lot of these companies have cyclical risk as well. If the Fed's cutting, the economy is not so good. So um, sometimes you're hoping for the Fed cutting, allowing big multiples, but it's going to impact earnings as well. These luxury names, you mentioned LVMH is up 31% year to date. Prada's up by 35% and change year to date. MS is up by 37%. MS, can we just finish there? Patrick, that's a name that I know you used to hold. Do you still hold it? Yeah, I still still hold that one. So coming into this year, I thought luxury was the best place to invest because it was trading slightly premium to the market multiple, and I could see real revenue growth benefiting from China reopening. So I've cut to LVMH. I still own Hermes. It's actually the biggest weight in my portfolio just because it's performed so well. But uh, that's another stock that uh, the same reason I sold LVMH, I've got to be thinking about Hermes. The reason I chose to sell LVMH first more likely to make an acquisition that's dilutive to shareholders was Ooh, my worry. Interesting. You think they might still be in the market for something big, Patrick, even they after have Tiffany's? To be. It's it's the tenth biggest company in the world now. It's producing tons of cash flow. Its whole business model is growing not just organically but through acquisitions. So um if you own companies trading at thirty times earnings, they use that uh, as a currency and uh, an acquisition I don't think is far off.
Patrick, thank you, sir, for weighing in. Patrick Armstrong of Plurumi Wealth. Interesting final thought there yeah, on Alfie MH, so. right? I mean, do you think it's a Tiffany tie-up? Or do you think it's... What are their luxury players I are out there? I can't think of, of something Lulu as large. Lemon. I'm not sure Lulu quite cracks it. <laughs> I mean, that's the issue, is sort of how do you decide what to go for where it's not some sort of you know brand dilution where you don't have consolidation risk? These are some of the issues, but that's very interesting. Christian Louboutin. Maybe, you know, Look, I'm just throwing I'm so out names. What do I know? You need, you need TK here. Brunello. Christian Dior. You know, go and get something big. I've got no idea. <laughs> I Brunello, I love. Don't touch Brunello. They probably own it already. <laughs> you're you know, offended. They probably own it already. <laughs> I've got no you're idea. Just, you're genuinely offended. But, but he was also saying is that, you know, this idea of understanding when something is overvalued at a time when people are hiding in what they perceive to be safe is a really interesting one. And you keep bringing this up. What is a safe defensive oh asset. yeah how cyclically exposed are these tech names you you heard him talk about it there no data is going to join us shortly not to talk about tech not to talk about luxury because none of us know anything about that <laughs> just throwing out random names that, that are owned by it other sound, companies it sounds luxurious <laughs> no data from next sense <laughs> macro joining us shortly to talk about the u.s economy you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's deputy, Dominic Raab, has quit after an investigation into bullying complaints. The probe criticized Raab's behavior toward civil servants. It's a major blow to Sunak. He's tried to present his government as a contrast to the Boris Johnson era, which was marked by political scandals. President Biden will crack down on U.S. investment in key parts of China's economy. Bloomberg's learned he'll sign an executive order in the coming weeks that will limit investing in Chinese semiconductors, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. The president's hoping to get the backing of its G7 partners. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will test the international waters ahead of a possible decision to run for president. DeSantis will pay a courtesy call on Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida during an international trade mission. A new Wall Street Journal poll shows DeSantis trailing Donald Trump 51 to 38 among likely Republican primary voters. And Procter & Gamble has raised its sales projection for the year ending in June. The maker of Bounty Paper Towels and Herbal Essence Shampoo cited higher prices and a slight increase in demand for some of its products. Meanwhile, P&G's quarterly results beat estimates and key metrics. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. This is not a credit crunch, this is a credit contraction. And there is a difference. A credit crunch is economy-wide, it has massive implication. A credit contraction has distributional effects. So we should be talking about the distributional effects, that's issue number one, and unfortunately that's gonna hit small businesses harder than big business. Brilliant to catch up with Mohammed al Erin, as always, Bloomberg Opinion columnist and Queen's College Cambridge president as well. Your equity market right now positive or rather negative by a tenth of 1% on the S&P. One hour and 13 minutes away from the opening bound. We're negative 0.07% on oh the S&P 500. Huge Trying decline. to recover. <laughs> the price change, there just isn't much yes. outside of equities in the bond market unchanged. 3.53 on a 10-year in the FX market. Euro dollar positive 0.1%, 109.80. Moments ago, Patrick Armstrong of Plurimi talking up selling LVMH because he thinks they're going to make an acquisition and followed by Bramo and I mentioning a bunch of companies that LVMH <laughs> already owns. <laughs> People writing in, thank N you. Name, name a luxury fund firm and basically they already own it over I, at LVMH. I mean, it already is some sort of a huge consolidated luxury uh, player, but at a certain point, if they have to acquire somebody else, where do they go? MS. 
They don't Apple. own that. They don't own that. Just I mean, to like... throw that out there. That's maybe <laughs> Apple's maybe the one company they, they can't afford. Just just the to one. be clear. Yeah. Let's get back to something we might know something about with Dan Tanabam <laughs> of Oliver Wyman. Dan joins us now. Dan, wonderful to catch up with you, buddy. I want to build on the reporting from our colleague Jenny Leonard from earlier on this morning that President Biden aims to sign an executive order in the coming weeks that will limit investment in key parts of China's economy by American businesses. Dan, where do you see this one going? Yeah, no, thanks, John. I mean, this outbound CFIUS, as it's been labeled for the, the last few months, is, is really the culmination of a focus of the Biden administration for the last two years. And I actually spent some time on the Hill a few weeks ago with some senior House GOP members that have been looking at this as well. I mean, this is actually something that, one, is a very bipartisan issue in the U.S. I think also you're going to begin to see more clarity, as there has been a lot of investor concern on what does this actually look like? Because we've seen in the past, the U.S. government attempted to regulate certain or limit investment in certain Chinese companies, and it had a pretty adverse impact on threats to delist um, and other sorts of challenges. But really, this executive order is going to cover specific investment of semiconductor companies, artificial intelligence and quantum computing companies in China, with a focus on U.S. firms playing an active role in management. So venture and private equity firms um, are really under the magnifying glass where they're largely managing and not just taking a passive investment in some of these specific sectors, not anything necessarily more broadly. Dan, forgive me for asking you to read the political tea leaves, but Jenny pointing out that this push will take place at this May summit for the G7 in Japan. Do you think the Allies will be on board with this push coming from the U.S. side? Yeah, it's something I've been looking at as well. I, I'm not sure how much Allied support really exists for this package. And this only has a chance of any sort of success with multilateral support. Otherwise, you're just going to essentially open up opportunities for other G7-plus allies to take the investments that American businesses are essentially restricted or investors are restricted from. You know, I think the U.S. administration has had a pretty good track record of beginning to gin up support for these type of issues. I think a lot of the challenge has been the confusion of what is this? And again, it's really been labeled as outbound CFIUS for the last few months, which takes on a much broader connotation than what we're talking about here, which is a narrower swath of Chinese firms and what type of investment restrictions would really be placed on U.S. companies. Dan, you were at the IMF meetings uh, last week. What's your read on how aware policymakers are on what kind of hit economically there would be if there was some sort of true fragmentation or breakdown in the relationship between China and the U.S.? Firstly, I can't believe that was a week ago, but that's a second issue. Um, I think there are a lot, of, a, a lot of concerns, and this is where this Biden administration team in, in Treasury is very careful about looking for unintent, unanticipated consequences, especially when doing, dealing with anything that has broader market impact. I think there's a huge focus on not disrupting um, you know, the China, U.S., China, Western efforts from a business standpoint, because there's still a substantial amount of trade. I think the decoupling threats have been somewhat overblown by the numbers, and, and Bloomberg certainly covered this as well. But I think there's a huge recognition that you can't only play around with this relationship too much before it has too many adverse consequences. I mean, who can forget at the end of the Trump administration, one exchange that was delisting, then not delisting, then delisting certain Chinese telecom companies that created some pretty massive confusion for a number of weeks. Well, but Dan, to just sort of spin this forward then, how comprehensive can some of these restrictions be that the Biden administration plans to put out there? How much meat can there be behind what Janet Yellen had to say last week about uh, the potential to put national security over economic interest? Yeah, it, it's a balancing act. I mean, there's obviously national security concerns. There's IP protection concerns. Um, you know, it's hard to say that they don't have broader economic protections for the U.S. economy as well. I mean, really, this is the investment restriction equivalent of some of the bans that the U.S. government has put in place, as well as certain other European nations on the ability for China to import certain high-tech components they need to potentially catch up in some of their technology manufacturing. Dan, just a final word on enforcement. We mentioned your name a little bit earlier on this morning, just with regards to foreign exchange and the US dollar. Dan, 
a de-emphasis around the US dollar, a push for that coming from China, other countries as well, just based, implied by some of the actions, agreements we've seen develop over the last month. Dan, where do you see that one heading? Yeah, I, I've had this discussion with your Saleh Mosin a number of times over the last five years. Look, we've heard the de-dollarization threat for the last 15 years as the U.S. has tried to force other countries to certainly choose in foreign policy decisions. I'm not sure that the world is going to move off the dollar quite so fast. And while we have seen larger countries like Brazil kind of push for this, India look to settle certain transactions outside of the dollar, I still don't know if the dollar dominance is going to erode quite so quickly. Dan, I think a lot of people listening to this right now might agree with you. Dan Tanaban there of Volvo Ironman. Coming up in the next hour on Bloomberg TV, looking forward to this. Great way to round out the week with this team here. Lisa Shannon of Morgan Stanley, Mike Collins of PGM, Tony Dwyer of Canaccord Gentlemen. We'll catch up with Tony around the opening bell. Lisa Shannon and Mike Collins with a lot to talk about around the Federal Reserve. Fixed income markets, Bramo, and ultimately in the equity market as well. Lisa's got a point, Lisa Shanna, and ultimately the message is don't look through this economic weakness. It's going to hurt. She thinks this is a dangerous moment for the equity market. A lot of people would agree. I mean, that's what we heard from Dan Suzuki as well, that basically, you know, it, this is what always happens before a downturn. You get certain rallies that keep coming back, and then all of a sudden people kind of settle into uh, what becomes more obvious. The question that I have is, if it's not this earnings season, then what's it going to be? It's not going to be the May 8th senior loan officer survey. There isn't going to be one data point that just changes everything. So what is going to be the catalyst that changes a direction, something more material, or is it going to just be this grind, this sort of angst for the rest of the year? It's a process is probably the phrase of the week, isn't it? Yeah. It's a process. Yeah, well, process and nuance doesn't really work well in markets or politics for that or matter. Or south side research sometimes <laughs> exactly. either. You want that headline, don't you, that exactly. just says south, 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 bye, bye, bye. I do sometimes think Sometimes it's more nuanced. I do think that next week the tech earnings are going to be really interesting. And I, I do think that they will be nuanced because it's not going to be necessarily a make it or break it kind of moment as Dan Suzuki correctly uh, uh, punted back at me. But I do think it's going to be telling as far as where we're going with the economy and the goods versus the services within tech and which is getting the money. And I think that'll be interesting. Dan Tanabam's right. A week? That was a week ago? It feels like forever. A week ago? I know. It's gone by so quickly. Exactly. And, I mean, again, this has been a really tough week. I mean, it's just been basically range-bound. It's snoozy now. It's nice and quiet. It's good, Bramo. Cheer up. It's mm. great. Going into the weekend, nice and quiet. <laughs> TK's taking a long I'm weekend. great. Just to enjoy himself. Kick By the back. way, can I just uh, make a correction? Earlier I said 1946 with the plastic over the furniture. It was more like the 70s, I think. That that oh, it was, was the more, 70s. That then. was more of like, yeah. That but was... the 40s feel like the 70s to you. Tom's going to love this when we talk about it on Monday. <laughs> we're not going to talk about it. That's what we're going to do. Or rather, the 70s feel like the 40s, but you get the point. <laughs> In the equity market, we're down by 0.05% on the S&P 500. Yields are unchanged, 353.37 on a 10-year from a beautiful New York City. Good morning to you all. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome back. About an hour before the opening bell here in New York. John's off to his 9 a.m. property. Tom taking a long weekend. And we are here without economic data now. We will get some at 9.45 a.m. Eastern. when We get the services and uh, the manufacturing PMIs for the U.S. The expectation is that it will follow the trend that we saw over in Europe earlier this morning with respect to services coming in hot and manufacturing coming in soft. This conversation I've heard I will need boxing gloves for, so I am prepared. Neil Dutta joining us right now, head of U.S. economic research at Renaissance Macro. And I am curious about your view after hearing all of the pessimistic prog uh, prognostications about why we should remain bearish, why you're coming on now to tell us we are all completely misguided and we need to be a little bit more optimistic. Well, good to see you, Lisa. Happy Friday. <laughs> Happy Friday. Uh, um, you know, look, I mean, I think what this business is about is about um, what the consensus is pricing in and what the likely outcome is going to be. Uh, that's how uh, that's how we dif distinct, you know, create some distinction here. And remember, the consensus is basically priced for, you know, essentially sudden stop dynamics in the economy. I mean, people are calling for recession starting, you know, sometime this week, it feels like. Um, <laughs> And I got to tell you, that's just not in the data. I mean, in my view, the time to have been concerned about recession was last year. 
I mean, it's not to say that we're not worried about things now, but it would have been more prudent to be even more worried last year. You had energy prices spiking. The global economy was going down the tubes, right? I mean, people are worried about Europe, whether they're going to keep, be able to keep the heat and the lights on. Uh, China was slowing down. Um, in the U.S., we had the housing market weakening, fiscal tightening, right? The, um, yeah. you know, and, and all the rest of it. So think about each of these things in turn, right? Fiscal policy, that's a tailwind for the economy now. Uh, there is no fiscal drag. Um, the government's a tailwind for growth. Uh, housing. Take so, a look at a chart of home building stocks. Anybody have that on their bingo card for 2023? <laughs> I think that people and missed a lot of things. The global PMIs that came out this morning. Now, admittedly, the manufacturing piece of it wasn't as strong, but you know, it's pretty clear that global growth in the aggregate is stronger so far this year than it was before. So if the consensus is talking about, you know, some sort of cliff dive moment in the second quarter. Uh, that's not happening. It doesn't mean that you don't pencil in a recession. I mean, I do think that if you want to be honest with yourself, you have to kind of keep this in the baseline outlook for the next 18 months. But the question is whether it's going to happen imminently, because that's what the consensus is expecting. Well, and um, I don't really see it uh, in the data. Neil, there are two aspects of this. There's growth and there's inflation. And what we have seen is that growth has slowed, uh, but it has not cratered in the same kind of way to, to highlight what you're talking about. And in certain sectors, has actually accelerated. And inflation seems to be coming down. Do you believe that this can continue, that you will see this sort of disinflation at the same time that there still is a lot of momentum underpinning the growth? Oh, wow. You, Lisa Abramowitz, growth in some parts of the economy accelerated. Man, that must have tasted like vinegar coming out of your mouth. Well, right? I've, <laughs> I've actually bought airplane tickets, so I understand that in some areas there is complete capacity. Carry on. Uh, look, I think to me, it it actually feels a little bit, um, I mean, I might get crucified for saying this, but Please, it does feel on. a little bit... It does feel a little bit like a soft landing. I mean, um, at the margin, the data is consistent with soft landing. I mean, think about what you just said. Inflation is slowing down, activity is holding up, right? I mean, you, you look at some of what the early reads are for auto sales in April, they're pointing to sequential acceleration, Lisa, for, for auto sales in April, despite this financing costs and the rest of it. And the builders are doing the same thing, sequential improvement in activity in April. So remember, everyone was talking about how housing is a leading indicator. And because housing was, was collapsing in 2022, that was going to spell the death uh, of the economy in early 2023. Well, now housing's reaccelerating. And it's highly likely that single family residential construction picks up um, over the next few months. Well, so. so I hear what Go you're ahead. saying, Neil, and I think that a lot of people would agree with you, which is a reason why you've seen the rallies year to date that has surprised a lot of people, even in some of the areas that people had left for dead or said that they were going to underperform. Now, however, a lot of people are saying just wait for it because the tightening credit conditions are going to really play out. And we're starting to see it around the margins with loan originations and credit loss provisions. How do you push back against that and say, look, it's just not going to happen. It's not that big of a drag. This happens as a feature of every single tightening cycle that we've ever had. Yeah, I mean, it's not good. The question is whether that's enough to push the economy into a below potential growth state that pushes up the unemployment rate. And I think um, we're not there yet. I mean, if you and, you know, speaking to the point about credit, keep in mind um, the housing market's working. That must mean that credit is flowing to households. Um, but more broadly, if you take a look at loan and leases or loan growth, um, you know, bank credit relative to GDP, um, it's basically been flat since 2016, 2017. So perhaps the economy is not nearly as credit sensitive as 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 is being made out to be. Um, you know, what I see is the reason why the economy has been holding up is because is because consumers have been doing OK. And the reason they're doing OK is because disposable incomes have been holding up. And that's going to continue because lower natural gas prices will bleed into household utilities. And, you know, the fact that, um, you know, wholesale gasoline futures have been declining, that's probably going to show up in lower pump prices in coming weeks. Um, so we're not going to get as much of a, uh, a food an energy and, frankly, uh, food tax a a as we've seen. And that's going to push up disposable income, which in turn will support consumer spending. Um, so I, I think that the, the credit sensitivity of the economy, um, you know, it certainly affects some sectors. I mean, I don't want to, you know, sort of sound like everything's great here, but, uh, you know, my, my sense is that disposable income growth will remain relatively uh, stable and probably continue climbing in the second quarter. Neil, you said and that you... I think that's 
And I think that's an important story. You said that you think that you'll get crucified by saying that uh, this is looking a lot like a soft landing. I would actually beg to differ. I think that probably people will say, yes, finally saying the quiet part out loud because the market agrees with you. It seems like the equity markets are pricing in a soft landing right now a lot in a lot of sectors. Do you disagree? I mean, how much is this already priced in? Not necessarily the recession calls that people keep waiting for. I think there's more room to go. I mean, I, I do think that you, you probably uh, continue to see, uh, you know, growth holding up. Um, you know, and I think you start to see parts of the inflation picture continue to imp continue to improve somewhat. Um, you know, we did see shelter come in quite a bit uh, in uh, in March. And remember, that's very inertial. It's sticky. So it's not going to start to reaccelerate uh, right away. Uh, so I think that that's an important development. And you know, when I think about the Fed, I mean, they're they're closer to the end of this than not. So it's unlikely that they're going to begin ratcheting up hikes immediately as well. So um, um, I, I do think you can make a, a case for equities here, um, you know, over the over the next uh, you know couple of quarters uh, for, for equities uh, to rally. And we continue to see a tailwind as well from from what's going on globally. Uh, that'll continue to pressure take pressure, I think, off the dollar. Um, which should provide earnings support for a lot of the uh, the cyclical names that do a lot of business overseas. How, um, how much do you see tech participating in this, especially with the earnings coming up next week? Are they still going to be the leaders at a time when there are a lot of areas that could perhaps recover if what you're saying comes to pass? Well, if the Fed is backing off, which I think is likely at some point this summer, um, you know that should uh, that should provide some talent for, for for technology stocks given their rate sensitivity how do you push back against the idea that we're getting right now sentiment really shifting and we saw that in the leading economic indicators we saw that in the fed beige book we saw that when it comes to just marginal softening in the labor market around the edges and yes you could say it's just marginal on the other hand it's starting it's starting in a more meaningful way now how do you say that is just par for the course, it's controlled, it's not going to pick up more meaningfully? Well, I mean, it's something that you have to be concerned about. I mean, the, to me, the risk is that, you know, you get this sort of, you know, snowballing effect in unemployment. But, you know, I would just say that they're offsets. It's very rare. I mean, people are pointing to continuing claims. Obviously, they're up, I think, like, what, 40% from the lows. Um, but you've also, typically, when that's happened, that's always been a recession. But then again, what about this recovery has been typical? As that's happened, You've seen prime age employment rates rise to cycle highs. That's never happened. You know, typically when continuing claims rise this much off the low, the prime age employment rate is already declining. It's off about, you know, anywhere from three tenths to half a percentage point from its from its peak, from its cycle peak. Hasn't happened. Right now, it's still going up to new highs. Yeah. Uh, consumer attitudes about the labor market still very, very strong. So I think it's really hard to know ex ante. And I think people should be a little bit more uh, show a little bit more like humility about this. It's very difficult to know ex ante whether um, you know this is the start of something truly nefarious or just a normalization of labor market conditions from unsustainably hot level hot rates uh, last year. Uh, well, my I sense is that there are offsets, Lisa. I mean, you have global growth getting better. You have U.S. housing. You have fiscal tailwind. Um, now you're going to have real income still holding up. Um, and you have the Fed backing off, uh, you know, sometime after, like probably in June. Um, and I think the risk is, is that, you know, the, I mean, they may have to come in later. That to me still is the risk, but I think you can make a case here um, for risk assets, um, you know, over the next couple of quarters um, when you get this sort of confluence of slowing inflation, growth holding up, um, Fed backing off. I guess that, Neil, before we have to end, I do want to just raise this one issue. And I think you're right about the humility point, and I feel it, and I think broadly I hear it all the time. I wonder about the fact that suddenly deposits aren't free anymore and the longer-term implications of that in the main credit impulse of this economy, which is the smaller regional banks. How do you factor that into your calculus at a time when that has to be before it happens? It cannot be with any material data just yet. No, I mean, I look. I take that point. There are there are certainly uh, areas of of concern uh, within the banking system. I mean, I think obviously people have been talking a lot about commercial real estate, but uh, and and the how the regional banks um, drive credit to that sector of the economy. But it's also important to remember that 
you know, when we think about structures investment in GDP, Lisa, that has rarely been as low a share of GDP as it is right now, right? So even if you're talking about a 20% drop in structures investment annualized, yeah, that probably gets you maybe half a point off of GDP growth. So, so um, you know, as I say, I mean, th th there are issues and clearly, um, you know, residential lending, I think, continues. And that's a big piece of it, too. Right. Yeah. So households are still getting credit when they want it. Um, but I take your point about what's going on with the small business. The question is, you know, there are areas of, of, of you know, of the economy that are weak, that look very bad. Right. I mean, uh, no right. one's denying that. The question is, is that enough? to push the economy into a below potential growth state. Remember, that's what's required, yeah. right? I mean, the Fed believes we need below potential growth for a period of time to um, basically quell the inflation issue. And Neil the Dada? question is whether we're getting it. I don't, I don't see it yet. Unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Don't be a stranger. I love speaking with you. I will put on my boxing gloves any day. Neil Dada of Renaissance Macro, thank you. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, complaints by government workers have brought down Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's close ally. Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab resigned after an independent investigation criticized his treatment of civil servants. The probe into accusations of bullying lasted months, and it threatened to undermine Sunak's pledge to restore professionalism to the government. The U.S. wants to cut its dependence on Taiwan's microchips because of concerns that China might invade the island. Now Taiwan, Taiwanese officials are quietly urging their American counterparts to tone down the rhetoric. They're worried that U.S. comments are harming their business interests. President Biden may formally launch his re-election campaign as early as next week. The president's aides have planned for the possibility of making a video announcement to coincide with the anniversary of his previous campaign launch. He's been signaling that he intends to seek a second term next year, making it somewhat of an open secret. The biggest global luxury conglomerate is shifting resources out of Hong Kong. Bloomberg has learned that LVMH wants to focus more on its investment in mainland China cities. Hong Kong used to be Asia's premium shopping hub, but mainland Chinese consumers have switched to buying luxury goods in their home cities. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I think real rates should probably be closer to zero or negative. You know, if inflation is going to be 3% next year or heaven forbid, 4% next year, you know, then how low can the Fed go in terms of nominal rates? Perhaps two, one, you know, but I do think if the uh, if the unemployment rate is rising, we see it peaking at five and a half next year. It's very similar to what happened after the savings and loan crisis. If you get that much weakening in the labor market, the Fed has to take real rates negative. That was Priya Misra, head of global rates uh, strategy at TD Securities, calling for Fed funds rates to possibly go as a base case to two or two and a half percent. The question wasn't whether the Fed would cut rates, but how quickly, in her view, based on the expectation that there will be a recession and unemployment to rise. A very different view from Neil Dutta, who was just on earlier saying there is no recession that's apparent in the data right now. Those dueling views are what's underpinning a lot of the range bound markets over the past couple of weeks. One area that has not been range bound this week has been in the crude market. I'm looking right now. Brent crude uh, down more than 5 percent this week, the biggest weekly loss going back to uh, March 17th in the immediate aftermath, the turmoil of the banking crisis. A real question around the why at a time of data that just isn't terrible. It's not been great this week, but it's not been terrible. Bloomberg's Julian Lee, who covers all things crude, uh, joining us now. Julian, what's your read on the why in terms of the narrative shift in oil markets? I think the why is that there are um, growing concerns that uh, demand isn't going to grow as strongly as, as forecasters have been predicting and that that is going to weigh uh, on oil markets in the, the particularly in the second half of the year, but in, in the, the second quarter as well. Um, if you look at the, the sort of the breakdown of forecasts by people like the International Energy Agency, 
a lot of their demand growth um, is very much skewed into the sort of the period from now to the end of the year. Um, and there are some fears that uh, we're seeing a, a glut of diesel um, and, and other middle distillates emerging perhaps in Asia. Uh, that could lead to refiners cutting back a bit on how much uh, oil they're processing. There are uh, growing concerns, as, as you know, some of the earlier guests have been suggesting, uh, around the, the strength of economic growth or the, 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 the rolling back of, of some of the strength of economic growth in, in the Atlantic, in, in both the US and in Europe. Um, that will have a knock-on effect on oil demand. And, and so there are concerns uh, that, that growth might not be as strong as, as people have been predicting. And then on the supply side, yes, we, we've had this announcement of um, cuts from uh, some OPEC plus members. They haven't come into effect yet. The one country that has said it's cutting output is, is Russia. Uh, but there's really no sign of that uh, flowing through into exports from Russia. And that's what really matters for the global oil market. I'm struggling with the narrative shifts that we're seeing in a lot of different areas of the economy. But it's not just crude. And I think that that's important because we've seen a lot of distortions that have been specific to this market and some people accusing OPEC plus of acting in a political manner by cutting production in response to an anticipation in a drop off in activity. But it's the broader commodity complex. It's copper, Dr. Copper, it's iron ore, it's across the board. So Julian, how much can we look at this and say something here is going on and perhaps it has something to do with the strength of China's recovery? Yeah, I, I absolutely think we, we can um, start to, to look at that. And I think there are real questions about uh, the strength of China's recovery going forwards and, and how um, and that recovery is going to link to commodities prices generally. I mean, we've become, uh, I think, very fixed on this idea that, that Chinese growth um, flows through to commodities very, very quickly and very, very strongly. Um, and what we might be seeing is something of a, a, a bit of a shift in uh, the strength of that flow through, perhaps, and that the, uh, the Chinese economy may um, recover um, a little bit more through domestic consumer spending rather than these very commodity intensive um, infrastructure investments that perhaps have driven a lot of the growth in the past. You know, I, the other issue, Julian, is that we talk a lot about how manufacturing is, is lower and underperforming, but that services are growing and that people want to have experiences. They are flying around in potentially uh, rates that are exceeding what we saw pre-pandemic. People are driving. People are using all of these forms of fossil fuels as they go around the world. How does that factor into uh, calls for potentially lower oil prices ahead? if that's only ramping up heading into the summer? Well, I think, I think it's, it's a matter of, of one sector balancing out another. Um, you know, if, if, we're, if we are seeing a pickup in, in transport, and it may be uh, that, that flights are getting fuller, um, as well as, you know, more flights being put on, the, 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 the growth in passenger numbers first will fill up the, the flights that are already going. Um, before people start scheduling uh, more flights. Um, um, but if you've got growth in the transport sector uh, being offset by uh, lower consumption in manufacturing, in construction, uh, those two may well weigh each other, you know, balance each other out to, to some degree. Um, and, and that, I think, um, is what we're perhaps seeing at the moment, that um, the... The, the growth in transport demand is is coming, um, but that's still a month or two away as, as people sort of perhaps uh, start thinking much more about taking holidays in the summer. Um, and we're not quite there yet. So this is this is still, I think, looking ahead a little bit. Meanwhile, Julian, as you sit there in London, I am curious about your view from Europe in the sense that we dodged a bullet this year. Some people attribute it to uh, ongoing exports from Russia that have been funneled through other areas in the refined form, but as well as a much warmer than expected winter. How much do you really see this as a permanent state of greater resilience in Europe in the face of less of an energy source from Russia? I think Europe is, is taking quite significant steps towards uh, building up a resiliency. But I don't think anybody here is 
is complacent, uh, that just because we've got through uh, this last winter, that the next one will be um, a walk in the park. Uh, we are very aware uh, that this winter has been uh, mild, that uh, natural gas demand, electricity demand has been lower because of that. But there have been, I think, across large parts of Europe, um, real steps taken uh, both to diversify supplies and, and liquefied natural gas from the US and elsewhere has played a big part of that. But there have been steps to uh, reduce consumption. Um, you know, we're seeing that both on a, a national level with governments taking the lead, but we're also seeing it, I think, on an individual level um, where high prices have led people to put on an extra sweater, turn the heating down, turn lights off um, to a much greater extent than they than they have done in the past. Um, and that, I think, has allowed quite significant savings um, of energy, which bode reasonably well for the coming winter, I think. And if you add to that the fact that um, natural gas stockpiles um, are being replenished quite quickly, um, partly because of the, the warmer winter that we've had, they didn't get drawn down so far. Um, that means, I think, that Europe should have a pretty solid buffer of, of gas uh, in storage ahead of the coming winter. Um, but, you know, we are very aware that we had some Russian gas still coming into Europe um, last year uh, by pipeline. We may have very, very little, if any at all, this yeah. year. Julian Lee, thank you so much for being with us uh, as we try to parse through some of the uh, market moves. And just to give you a sense, Exxon and Chevron both reporting a week from today. So possibly we'll get a sense of what kind of earnings view they look for going out as well as the supply demand dynamic. Uh, this out of Downing Street, uh, that UK uh, Prime Minister uh, Richie Sunak is appointing Oliver Dowden as a new Deputy Prime Minister this coming after the former UK Deputy Prime Minister Dominique Robb said that he was going to to step down. He was going to resign after an independent investigation criticized his abrasive treatment of civil servants. He said on Twitter earlier this morning in a letter to Sunak, uh, saying, I feel duty bound to accept the outcome of the inquiry. A difficult moment, really, for Rishi Sunak, considering that Dominique Robb was a major ally in trying to rebuild uh, the administration after Boris Johnson. We will keep uh, getting a sense of that. Really a fraught time, especially with inflation still coming in with double digits, but real questions about how resilient the economy is at a time of ongoing angst around the inflation picture, but also salaries and economic momentum in markets. We can see a bit range bound after a week trying to digest all of the shifts that we have seen over the past few weeks for the best moments from surveillance and daily insights from the show. Don't forget our daily news letter. Sign up at Bloomberg.com slash surveillance. This is Bloomberg.